Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. Entitled Parents at Chick-fil-A do not recognize the meaning of closed. Hey, it's me, the one Chick-fil-A guy again. Anyway, like I said, I've got a few stories to share from this whole sickness fiasco, so here's another one for y'all. Today I'm going to be telling the tale of the family who did not recognize that we are privileged to close whenever we need to. So for some background, we usually close at 10, but since everything's been going on, we've started closing at 8. Usually there are a few people each night who will pull up after we close, and they're naturally disappointed but understanding, and we try to not let them leave with a bad experience. However, once in a while, some people refuse to take no for an answer. So on this particular Saturday evening, I was working what we call the cash box. If you've never been to a Chick-fil-A, or at least one that does this, it's essentially a cash register midway through the drive through that takes payments, processes mobile orders, and resequences the order of cars in case the order is wrong. It's pretty efficient and keeps the people at the window from taking too many payments. So anyway, the time was about 7.55 and I was at the cash box, sitting on a little bench and making sure the tablet was charged. There were three or four cars in the line who I had already taken the payments from and I was just chatting with one of the iPos people, the guys who come to your cars with iPads and take your order. We were just talking about the weekend and stuff while waiting for cars. One more car came through the drive through so after I took its payment, I started to pack up the cash box, which consists of a moderately heavy register and an iPad. The person I was talking to put the immortal cone in the drive through to show that we are closed for the evening. They propped open the back door and went inside while I was wrapping up wires to the receipt printer and iPad charger. As I was packing everything into the container to bring it inside, I saw a car pulling around the cone towards the window of the drive through Since I was between them and the window, I stood on the curb next to the drive through and put my hands up in the stop gesture. I checked my phone and it read 804, so we were definitely closed with only one car in line. The car was a red minivan being driven by a fairly large, stomach-wise anyway, dude with a woman in the passenger seat. I could hear at least two kids in the back seat, but it was dark and the glare from the windows kept me from looking in. The driver rolled down the window and the conversation went as follows. Me. I'm sorry sir, we're closed. We won't be able to serve you tonight. The guy in the driver's seat was very not happy. He was also not wearing a mask, which made me uncomfortable at the beginning. His words did not help the situation. Entitled Dad. P.S. I see a car at the window, and if you're helping them, you'll help us too. Me. They had their order taken 10 minutes ago, and they've been waiting very patiently, sir. It doesn't matter if you go up there. They're not going to serve you. Entitled Mom. Excuse me. My daughter wants a milkshake, and you're going to get it for her, understand? I could hear a girl screaming about her brother taking a toy or something in the back seat, and the mother turned around and very loudly whispered at them to be quiet. Now, I know that I didn't have to sit here and listen to this lady, but I also know that it wouldn't look good on my performance review if the guy they hired for being good with people basically said, no, you're going to leave so I can go home and never have to deal with you again. So my reply was, well, miss, I suggest you look somewhere else for that milkshake because we are closed. Our kitchen and shake machines are shut down and I doubt there's even food for the employees in there. So I'm sorry, but I can't help you and yelling at me will not change anything. By this time, the car in front of them had pulled forward and the guy in the driver's seat looked at me and said, I'm going to go up there and get my food and you can kiss my butt. I responded, Sir, if you go up there, you will not be served. If you refuse to leave, we will call the police and have you arrested for loitering and trespassing on private property. 
and then you can do whatever you want with your butt in court. I then turned around and went back to packing up the cash box, ignoring the sounds of raw anger and hatred coming from behind me. As the guy pulled his van up, I got on the walkie-talkie we have outside and told the people at the window there was a very angry guy and his family coming to the window. I then finished packing up the cash box, told one more car we were closed, they took it much better than the first family, and went inside. I put the cash box in the office in the back of the store and went to the front to see if the van was still there. It turns out my coworkers had just locked the sliding glass window after about 20 seconds of dealing with the people. From what I was told, they stayed outside for a minute or two, but eventually left when they saw a manager picking up a phone. This story does have a bright side though. I was wrong. The shake machine was not shut down yet and there were some nuggets and one cheese sauce left. So I wound up getting dinner after all. So that's all for tonight. People showing up late is a pretty common thing and we don't usually have to threaten people with the police. So someone taking this normal situation in such an extreme way was pretty memorable. Have any of you ever had Chick-fil-A? And if so, did you like it? Please let me know. They're okay. I prefer Panera Bread. My entitled father wants me to give up one of my $300 bikes. Some backstory. About four years ago now, I was 14 then, now 18. My brother and I got a bike each from our parents for our birthdays. Our birthdays are 12 days apart. These bikes were $60 from Walmart and so weren't made with the best parts. I decided that I would make my bike something of a project for me to learn about fixing up bikes. I poured a lot of my own money into this bike, changing the chain, the wheels, the seat, the handlebars. I had to replace the tubes no less than two times for each wheel and I learned to do it all with a little bit of help from our local bike shop when I got stuck on something. A little over two years ago, my brother, who never rode his own bike, decided that I could just have his as a backup if I needed. So just like with my own, I poured so much time and money into getting that bike to be just as good into my main one. All in all, I probably spent $300 on my main bike and maybe $200 to $250 on my backup. I am extremely proud of what I was able to accomplish with them. My father has always wanted the very best of everything, even if we couldn't afford it. He couldn't just have a TV. He needed a $600 TV with Wi-Fi connection. He didn't just need a computer monitor. He needed a $250 curved monitor. This all despite the fact we are often hanging at the edge of eviction from our house. Now, before you call me a hypocrite for spending my money on the bikes, I will point out that I have my own job and used solely money I had to spare on those bikes. My father hasn't had a job since 2011. My father refuses to go to the doctors to treat his diabetes and blood pressure issues because he believes that all the doctors want to do is make him think he is more sick than he is while draining all of his money. We actually had to fight him for two years to go to the doctors just so he could get disability so he could afford groceries and pay the bills instead of just one or the other. Anyways, recently my father has gotten the idea into his head that all he needs to feel better is to start exercising again. While this isn't the worst idea in the world, he is far beyond the point where only exercise can fix his problems. The guy can't even walk in a straight line or stand for more than 20 minutes without getting lightheaded. He has been told on one of the times we had to rush him to the ER that he has gotten so bad he needs medicine to fix the damage he has done to his body. He is also dealing with kidney failure and needs weekly dialysis, which he doesn't consider in the same league as those evil doctor visits. He's in no shape to be riding a bike, but that didn't stop him from coming to me while I was looking over the back tire of my bike. I crashed like an idiot and the tire warped. The following conversation happened. My father. Hey OP, how close are you to fixing that bike? Me. I don't really know. I think the back tire may be warped. If so, I might need a new one. Well, you have two bikes, and so I was thinking that when you get that one fixed, maybe I could have it to ride around this summer. It would really help me feel better. Now, I have actually lent my bikes out to friends before as we live in a small town, and honestly, you don't need a car to get from place to place so most of us just go around on bikes in the summer to save gas. But this man was so sick, he was leaning on the door frame just to talk to me. I was not about to have him riding one of my bikes and crashing it and getting himself and my bike hurt. 
I also knew when he crashed it, I would have to fix it right away. So no thank you. Me. Um, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with that. Maybe we could just get you a new $60 one from Walmart. Dad. But I don't want one from there. Those bikes are crap and will break so fast. Me. Well, I don't feel comfortable with you on one of my bikes. You are sick and I think you would crash it and I know you won't be able to fix it. Dad. They're not even your bikes anyway. We bought them for you and your brother and he didn't want his. Surely you don't need both. Me. Actually, I do. This one needs work and I still need a way of getting around. Plus, you said those bikes belong to me and my brother and he didn't want his. So they are mine. Unless you want to give me the money I put into them back. Dad. We bought them. They are ours. Me. No, I spent my money on them. And the only thing that is still original on that bike is the frame. I will pay you the $60 if you want and you can use it to buy your own bike. At this point, my father is red in the face and starts yelling about how I am so ungrateful and how he never gets to exercise and how it's no big deal. I refuse to budge. Eventually, our mom comes home and hears all of this. I kid you not, he goes to my mother like a toddler who has had his toy car stolen and says that I'm refusing to let him use my bike and that it's such BS. My mom, as if she could read my mind, says, why don't we just get you a cheap $60 bike to ride? You only need it to ride around the neighborhood. This made him go ballistic, throwing a fit about how we all had decent bikes except him, which isn't wrong as my mother bought a souped up bike she bought from the bike store when it was on sale for a charity event a few years ago. We pointed out that we both like to go trail riding and ride around town while he only wants to ride around the neighborhood. He said that it shouldn't matter that he had a right to have a decent bike. Eventually, my mother relented and offered to let him use her old bike. Although it's a really old bike and you'll never guess who is in charge of fixing it up so he can ride it. If nothing else, I was told that once I fixed it up, I wouldn't have to do anything more. I am only going to change the tubes as the tires are still good enough and I am going to get the chain greased instead of replaced. What would you do if you were in this situation? Would you let your dad ride one of your bikes? Please let me know. Who needs a bike anyway? Why not just get a Mercedes or a BMW? He ruined my sister's only birth experience, so I made sure he'd never forget her. Our cast. We've got my sister. We'll call her Sarah for the story. We've got sister's ex-boyfriend, Paul. We've got ex-boyfriend's new wife, Jane. We've got ex-boyfriend's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Doe. We've got oldest brother, Zeke, our parents, and me. When I was 14 and my oldest sister, Sarah, was 22, we found out that she was pregnant with Paul, her boyfriend of four years. They immediately got engaged and they were really happy for a time. Sarah had a horrible pregnancy. About 16 to 18 weeks in, the wonder of creating human life evaporated within her. She developed hypermesis, which if you don't know is a really bad morning sickness. She was constantly in pain. She developed gestational diabetes and just all around hated the experience. Around this time, Paul, the then fiance, started getting sick of the complaining. I believe the argument was, your body is built to do this, it can't be that bad. Sarah was due around Valentine's Day and Paul's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Doe, were very excited both about the grandkid and the fact that he would be born on a holiday. She was very against that and really, really hoped that her son wouldn't be born on a holiday, even one as small as Valentine's Day. Her birthday sometimes falls on Easter and she hates it because it might make him feel that his day isn't very much about him. Well, Mrs. Doe says something like, well, if you name him Valentine or Valentino, then that'll make the day even more special to him. Again, sister hated the idea. She thought it was tacky, he'd be bullied for it, and just really didn't like the name Valentino. Paul loved it, but agreed to go with a more average name like Daniel or Jared. Fast forward to February, and she was ready to get this over with. Sarah had officially been put on bed rest because while standing or walking, her blood pressure took unexpected spikes and dips. I look back now, and goodness do I feel bad for her. She was doing her best to avoid giving birth on Valentine's Day because, again, she didn't want him to be born on a holiday. Unfortunately, births happen when they happen, and that baby was going to come on Valentine's Day whether she wanted him to or not. 
I remember waiting out in the waiting room with my dad, brothers, and Paul, who couldn't stand to be in the delivery room because it was gross. I was so mad that he could have gone in, but wouldn't because he thought my sister was gross while giving birth, whereas I had to stay outside because I was too young to go in with my mom and other sister. Dad went home with the youngest twin brothers while the oldest, Zeke, stayed to watch me because I refused to leave. 16 hours after Sarah went into labor, my little nephew was officially part of the family on the evening of Valentine's Day. Unfortunately, Sarah was not okay. She had to go to an emergency C-section and while doing the operation discovered that the back of her uterus facing her spinal cord had a very large and very severe, thankfully non-cancerous, tumor. When I say large, I mean it was twice the size of a standard uterus. The doctors were shocked and didn't understand why nobody had noticed it on an ultrasound. It accounted for her severe back pain and blood pressure issues. The doctors immediately went in for more surgery to remove the tumor but sadly ended up having to perform a full hysterectomy. This meant that my nephew would be Sarah's only child. Now, while Sarah was in for surgery, Paul was taking care of everything baby-related to make sure his son was okay. In my 14-year-old self's memory, I remember him being suitably distraught, but I didn't really pay him much mind and spent my time in the waiting room with my mother and other sister. Zeke, however, wanted to be a good future brother-in-law and make sure that Paul was okay. He found Paul filling out the baby paperwork on his own, looking, in my brother's words, like he had not a single worry in his mind. Zeke asked why Paul didn't wait for Sarah to fill out the paperwork, as she should have been out of surgery within the hour, and Paul said that he just wanted her to get her rest and heal. That checked out with Zeke, as he was 16 and didn't know any better at the time. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. No, he wouldn't. He knows how much she hates that name. And still, she'd need to sign the paperwork too. My fellow people of Reddit, I regret to inform you that Paul forged Sarah's signature on the paperwork and waited until she was out of surgery to hand said paperwork over. My sweet nephew that was born on Valentine's Day was named Valentino on his first official birth certificate. I still to this day don't know why Paul and his family were so insistent about the name. He had even picked out a different one with my sister. And before you ask, no, he was never brought up on forgery charges because his parents were witnesses to her signing the papers, even though they only got there at the last minute. So Sarah dumped him and got her son's name changed a month later. She was willing to do split custody with him because that's her son's father and she wants the kids to know him. But Paul vanished and she never heard anything back, which seemed weirdly out of character to us until a mutual friend on Facebook was tagged in his wedding pictures six months later. Paul had apparently started cheating on her not long after she got pregnant. Sarah was livid, but there wasn't much she could do, so she filed for child support and continued to live her best life. Until six years later. This is where the revenge starts, my friends. So Sarah has been a single mother for the past six years and has been amazing at it. At this point in my career, I've been a hairdresser for about 8 months at our local Great Clips. I'm working one day, and who is seated before me but Jane, Paul's wife, herself. I take her back for a trim, and she clearly has no idea who I am. That adds up, because a mutual friend that still keeps in contact with Paul said that Jane doesn't know a thing. She has no idea about Sarah, that she was the other woman, or that Paul actually has a kid that he's been infrequently paying child support for. She's in the dark on it all. I told myself not to be a jerk and treat her like a normal customer, which I did. Now at this point, Jane was heavily pregnant, so a lot of our conversation was about that. She loved being pregnant, but it was hard. Her husband was so unsympathetic, big shocker, and she was due in 10 weeks, and they still hadn't picked out a name for their baby. Ladies and gentle peoples, this was my chance. I asked what kind of name she was looking for, and she said, I want something unique and unusual, but not ridiculous, like Brent Leahy. You know the ones I'm talking about. And Paul had suggested so many already, and she didn't like any of them. So I, conniving little weasel I am, said, What about Sarah? My sister's name isn't actually Sarah. She was named after an older family member that passed not long after she was born. But there was no female equivalent for his name, so our parents created one. It's a beautiful name and just what Jane was looking for. 
She loved it. She stuck by it. And I found out by stalking her Facebook months later that she had put her foot down about it and that that was their daughter's name. Now Paul has a daughter with his ex's name to remind him every day about her and to also remind him to pay his child support. Little nephew is 10 years old now with a new name and no contact with his biological father. Though we do still sometimes call him Val as a family nickname. He likes it but doesn't want to bring it to school, so it's staying a family nickname. Sarah pretends to hate when we call him that in a joking way. As long as he likes it, she doesn't have a problem with it. And she's seeing a new guy who's really great and like a father to Val. Do you have any unique and interesting names picked out for the kids you'll have in the future? If so, what are they? Please let me know. If you're expecting a girl, I highly suggest Karen. Karen joins our club. Some years ago, I was finally out of debt and ready to start investing for my future. But I didn't have a clue how. That's when I heard about a national organization that promoted investment clubs, offering support and tools to help people like me learn about investing by doing it. I liked the idea. Get smarter, play low stakes, and maybe have a beer or two while you do it. So I told a few friends, they talked to their friends, and pretty soon we had a budding investment club. Since we were all friends of friends, organizing went smoothly. We elected officers and adopted a simple charter based on the national group's templates. Minimum monthly dues were set at $10, an amount any one of us could afford to throw away. But any member could contribute more than the minimum if they liked. And to build up our investing pot, most of us did. Individual contributions bought shares in the club's holdings, like stock in a corporation. Higher contributions meant more shares, meant more voting power when we made club decisions. As we got rolling, a few more people heard about the club and expressed interest, so we created a little process. Attend three meetings as the guest of a member, then if you're still interested, club members decide whether to offer an invitation. We always did. Sign the charter, pay this month's dues, and you're in. Most new members paid extra for at least a little while to catch up to the voting power of the founding members, so everyone stood on more or less equal footing. By year two, we had settled into a friendly routine, holding monthly meetings that were one part socializing, one part learning, and one part considering what to do with our growing little pot of cash. We picked a few stocks, started buying a few shares at a time, and portfolio performance was added to the monthly treasurer's report. We cheered each modest gain and learned from our small losses. Then came Pat. Pat was an outlier in our friend group. Most of us knew her, but few knew her well. She had a reputation for being a little too loud, a little too blunt, a little too much of a jerk, a little too rude, but she was also known to be smart. In a club focused on learning, more smart couldn't hurt, right? Besides, our well-respected president had brought her in. And right away, Pat proved she was smart. She had reviewed our charter and our past minutes before she came to her first meeting. She asked solid questions about past decisions and our reasoning. She listened respectfully to the education and stock study presentations, probing politely, and made mostly appreciative comments after each meeting. Just a bit of a smarty thrown in once in a while, but we could handle a bit. After her third meeting, we sent her to the next room while we discussed inviting her to join us. There were a few misgivings expressed. We had all heard stories about Pat's capacity for unpleasantness, after all. But President said, I warned her pretty bluntly that she needs to behave when she's here. We're all friends, but this is business. Money is serious. So I told her, keep yourself in check. Leave your attitude outside. Ultimately, everyone agreed. She had indeed behaved. We had no reason to doubt her sincere interest. So we called Pat back in and President said, Congratulations, Pat. Just pay your dues and sign here. With a flourish, Pat handed Treasurer a $10 bill and everyone applauded as she signed the charter. Then she said, Thank you all, thank you. But frankly, you really don't have any way to keep me out. The room got quiet. She then turned to Treasurer and said, Now, next month, if I'm interpreting your little reports correctly, all I have to do is give you this much money and I'll have equal voting rights, is that right? That's about right, yes, came the answer. And if I were to give you that plus, and here she pointed at the bottom line of the club's total holdings, this amount, I'd become the new majority shareholder, right? I suppose. And then I'd be in charge of all the club decisions, declared Pat. That's right, 
Unless you all can keep ponying up more cash than I can, there's nothing you can do to stop me from running this club like my own private account with nearly double my money to play with, is there? And now that I've signed your silly charter, you don't even have any way to kick me out. So, see you all next month. She smirked, turned, and left. The door had just barely closed when the room exploded. She was joking, right? Oh, heck no. The nerve. Could she really do that? That can't be real. How big a mistake did we just make? Wow, what a class A jerk. But as we looked over our template-based charter, we found she was right. There were requirements for tax reporting, officer fiscal responsibilities, bank and brokerage relationships, conflicts of interest, and a host of other issues we had never faced and never expected to face. There was boilerplate language about how to buy out a voluntary withdrawing member. There was a provision allowing us to involuntarily withdraw someone who didn't keep up with dues and or attendance, but we had no cap on individual member contributions and no provision allowing us to kick out a stakeholder so long as they continued to pay their dues and attend meetings. And we now realized that if she could make good on her threat to buy majority holding, Pat could simply outvote any attempt to amend our charter. A more elegant solution probably existed, but within 20 minutes, someone came up with the nuclear option. Two minutes later, we agreed to launch it. We accepted assignments, then went our separate ways to prepare for next month's meeting. That evening, everyone arrived a bit more promptly and settled a lot more quietly than usual. Pat looked smug as she took a seat, seeming not to care that no one spoke to her. She was ostentiously fanning herself with a personal check. Too bad we never saw it, so we'll never know if she really was ready to put her money where her loud mouth had been. President took the floor. Before I call the meeting to order, I have a personal announcement to make. I made a really poor recommendation to all of you last month. I feel the bad judgment I showed means I am not fit to be your president. I'm presenting my letter of resignation and my voluntary withdrawal from the club, and solemnly gave the letter to secretary. Pat looked like she had been slapped, but she said nothing more. Treasurer spoke up. Just so you all know, President spoke to me earlier about this decision, so I've already calculated withdrawal payout and have it ready, according to the terms of our charter, and President took the check. Vice President spoke next. President, you weren't alone in that decision. I voted with you, and I also regret my poor judgment. Here is my letter of resignation and withdrawal, Treasurer said, and here is your withdrawal payout, prepared as we discussed. And it went on, in small clusters at first, then all in a rush, each club member declared they had made a terrible decision, presented a letter, and collected an already prepared check. Sometime during the rush, Pat stopped being silent. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Seriously, you've made your point. That's enough now. You don't have to keep up this act. Knock it off already, you idiots. But we didn't. With all the letters collected, Secretary added them to the bank of a fat binder containing copies of all the club minutes and gave the binder to Pat. Your next club secretary will need this. Treasurer was right behind with a similar binder of financial records, a $10 bill on top. Here are all your club's accounting records and remaining assets. President added the signed charter to the stack. So, Pat, looks like you're now a club of one. You win. Good luck and goodbye. We all stood and stared silently until she shoved the stack to the floor and saw herself sputtering to the door. Within 10 minutes, we had signed our newly upgraded charter, re-elected our officers, torn up all of our payout checks, and put our new club back to business as usual. Okay, maybe just a bit more giggly and a bit more pleased with ourselves than usual. Never saw Pat again, didn't care. Lesson learned, never let Karen join your club. What if I don't want to join your stupid club? New coworker doesn't want help. Okay. Note, this story is old. I've not worked at this place for years. Also, this is not the same job as my post about helping my coworkers. Story time. I worked in a pharmacy dedicated to sending medications to nursing homes. Since this is often difficult to do just by hand, there were machines that could help out. I often helped use the machines to package the meds. A new coworker joined my team. She was pleasant enough, but for some reason I could not tell you, even to this day, why I hated her on site. Apparently the feeling was mutual, though we were able to work together cordially enough. Since the machines, while super useful, were also prone to breaking down, a lot of manual intervention was required to ensure smooth operation. Since it's a pharmacy, 
we also had to keep track of the medications being used on it, which means counts, often done nightly, particularly with more expensive medications. This information is relevant. I had been at this job for a few years, so was reasonably experienced with the use and maintenance of the machines. Coworker wasn't. This is also where I point out that coworker is older than me. So, coworker had been at the job for a few weeks and had received some training. So my boss at the time, I've written a post about that creature elsewhere, told me that it'd be okay for her to shadow me while I worked, but also to make sure she did some of the work on her own, so she had learned via hands-on experience. This also meant I couldn't leave until coworker did, since she hadn't been given the go-ahead to be alone with the machine. Goody. It went more or less okay for the majority of the shift. I let coworker do some of the work as ordered by my supervisor, and she seemed to be getting it. However, for some reason, she wasn't relying on the computer, which had kept track of all the medications used and their corresponding slots to do the nightly count. Instead, she was literally writing down every single slot and medication by hand to count later. Coworker, I said, you know the computer keeps track of that. I know it does, yarn and metal, but I don't seem to get how to do it. This is towards the end of my shift. My nerves were fried from having to deal with her, and I was tired. You do it like this, coworker. I show her. I don't get it, yarn and metal, so I'm just going to do it by hand. You younger people don't seem to have a problem with computers, but I do. Let me do it by myself. People, the process to see what had been used was literally two clicks of a mouse button. I had shown her once at the start of our shift. Our supervisor had shown her during initial training. Another coworker had shown her while she was training. I was done. So I let her do exactly what she wanted. Let her write down every canister by hand, every med by hand, and let her count by hand. I even offered, as a show of good faith, to help with the counting. But again, no yarn and metal, I'll do it. Let me do it by myself. Fine. As a result, we ended up leaving an hour after our shifts were supposed to end. That's an hour of overtime that we hadn't been authorized to take for the record. Next day, my supervisor asks me why I'd stayed so late. So I told her very honestly that coworker didn't want my help finishing out the necessary counts last night. Supervisor, being what she was, yes, my wording there is deliberate, immediately went and ripped coworker a new one. The day after, coworker didn't come in. We all found out she had quit, effective immediately. Good riddance, I guess. Bonus after math. I also found out the day after I had to stay so late that the counts coworker did, they were wrong. All of them. What would you guys rather do? Count things by hand or use a computer? Please let me know in the comments below. I prefer to do it myself, but there's one thing that I have to use technology for. And what's that? Obliterating that like button for Mr. Reddit. Oh, nice. Karen rages at the gas pump. This is my first time posting something like this. On mobile, please be kind. Also, this happened more than 10 years ago, so I will just give the gist of what was said but I will quote the parts I remember clearly. Cast is pretty self-explanatory, maybe more entitled person than parent. She had a kid with her, but the kid wasn't really involved. I hope you enjoy it anyway. My family and I were on a camping trip. My dad and I went to a nearby town to get some groceries and gas for the minivan. When we got to the pumps, there was only one spot open, but quickly after we got out, most of the spots opened up. I think there were four rows of pumps, but in any case, we were in the row second furthest from the store. Dad was filling the car with gas, and my job was to clean the windows. We were goofing around and just having fun joking with each other. I noticed a lady, Karen, and her kid in a small car pull up behind us and thought it was weird, specifically because there were several pumps open around us, but shrugged it off. After a couple of minutes, she backed up really quickly and abruptly pulled into one of the pumps in the last rows which had been empty the entire time she was there. We were just finishing up. I was putting the squeegee away when I noticed Karen, red-faced and shaking, stomping over to us. She yells at Dad, Can't you read? Dad and I just look at each other, confused. She stomps over to the end of the pumps and basically punches the sign as she points to each word. Small cars only. We look at the sign, which honestly was pretty weathered. Just a basic paper sign with really thin pen written letters. We might have noticed it if we'd been parked, but Dad genuinely looked surprised to see it. I for sure hadn't. He apologized, stated he didn't see it, 
but that the gas was probably still the same and there were lots of pumps open. Something to the effect of, he would keep that in mind for next time. Karen continued to rage at him and dad just kept cool as a cucumber and kept throwing some grins my way to keep me calm. He repeated several times in different ways that what's done is done and we're just about to leave anyways and he will keep it in mind for next time. Not much more to be done about it now. I think it ended when he asked her what she would like him to do about it and she didn't have an answer so she stomped back to her car. Dad gave me a yikes look and laughed as we headed into the store to pay for the gas and grab a few snacks. As he was paying, he also apologized to the teller for not noticing the sign. She said that it wasn't a big deal. It's mostly just there to try to keep the visibility clear to the back pumps, but as our van didn't have tinted windows and she could see through, it really wasn't a problem. Dad told her about Karen and said he would be more mindful next time. They both laughed it off and we headed back to the van. Now, Dad can be a little bit of a jerk sometimes to people who are being ridiculous. It's a trait that's gotten him into trouble a few times and probably not the best way to handle people in a heightened emotional episode, but it is what it is. So as we were pulling out, one of those big 15 passenger vans pulled into the spot we just vacated. As we were passing her, he rolled down his window. It looked like she was just in the process of paying at the pump. Dad said, oh look, it's another big car. Better call the cops. I have never in my life seen a full-grown woman devolve so fast into a toddler temper tantrum in my life. She immediately started screaming incoherently and stomping her feet and pumping her fists. He rolled up his window as we got past her and we started laughing about it. She peeled out of that parking lot so fast she burned rubber. It was one of those gas stations in a strip mall, so we navigated through the lot on the actual aisles but she peeled straight through the parking spots and fishtailed out before us. I was scared for her kid. There was no other confrontation. She just kept driving. We saw her again in the grocery store on our last grocery run, but she didn't see us, so we just hustled through our list and did our best to avoid her. To this day, I just can't fathom how someone can get so worked up about something that didn't even negatively impact her. She must have thought there was something special about the small car gas, because nothing else makes sense to me. Why do so many Karens worry about things that have nothing to do with them? And what would you have said to this Karen if she came up to you like this? Please let me know. She was right. He's lucky I wasn't there that day. Another one bites the dust. A little backstory. I'm a painter. No, not a house painter, but someone who paints on canvases. I paint landscapes and only landscapes, and I've been doing it for a few years now. I get my paints from a hobby store that has just about everything and it's a well-known local store that changed hands in the last couple of years. All spelling errors, formatting errors, and story errors are mine and mine alone, so forgive me. On the day this story is about, I was in my usual cargo shorts, which I wear year-round even when there is snow outside, tennis shoes, and a nice pullover shirt. Think fancy t-shirt with a collar. Oh, and I'm like 60-ish. I hadn't had a haircut in months and also hadn't shaved in like a week, so I was rather scruffy looking. Think a clean homeless guy with clean clothes, and that is a big thing with my wife, as she insists that I don't leave the house looking like I've lived in my clothes for a week. As you might guess, I'm a messy painter, and I tend to get paint on my clothes, so I change into something clean and without any rips or tears before leaving the house. I was looking at some brushes on an end cap that part of the shelves at each end of the aisle. When this woman clears her throat, now, I get stuff in my throat and have a rattle sound when clearing, so my brain just filtered out the sound and I moved a little to one side and closer to the end cap in case I was in the way. Once again came that throaty sound like a frog choking on an oversized cricket while trying to sing. This time I look at the source of that sound and find a woman, maybe 5 foot 2, a little thick with a short fake blonde haircut. I think the ladies call it a bob. A cart with some plastic plant foam bricks in it and raised eyebrows. Now, the uniform here is black pants and a store polo of any number of colors. Oh, and each and every employee has a black apron on except for management. It's a pretty good sized store and the only one of its kind for an hour or two in any direction. So the store monopolizes the region. Cheaper prices can be found in the big city, but that's almost two hours away. And by the time you've spent the gas to get there and back, you've not really saved a whole lot. Now that you know the backstory, the scene played out like this. 
Me is old gnome looking guy. CL is crazy lady. The assistant manager is Judy and the manager is Katie. Me. Is there something wrong with your throat? I asked a little concerned. Crazy lady. No, there is nothing wrong with my throat. What is wrong is you just standing there instead of helping customers. Me. Ah, I said, instantly recognizing the Karen in the wild from the many tales I've heard over the years. You think that I work here? No, duh. I see you in here all the time. I know you work here. Me. I'm in here because I buy things. Yeah, and the other day I saw that you got an employee discount, so I absolutely know you work here. So help me find my stuff. Me, with a faint smile. Stuff? Oh, you need to go to the Stuff Mart. I nearly doubled over with laughter as her brow became a maze of lines as her two working brain cells spun crazily inside her cranium trying to figure out Stuff Mart and whether there actually might be a place called Stuff Mart or if I was pulling her leg. Then she waved her hand through the air as if clearing it of smoke and said, Never mind, you help me now. I looked down at my cargo shorts and said, Okay, for the sake of the argument, let's say I do work here. Obviously, I'm not wearing the proper uniform, so this must be my day off and such. That would mean I am not working today. So tell me again, why would I help you if I'm not working today? Because you work here, she screeched and stomped her foot. Me, but don't even the peons get days off when they don't have to work? Now, with a really screeching voice, the crazy lady yells, If you don't tell me right this minute, I'm going to get you fired. Then came the mantra of all Karens, Get me your manager. I could hear the clippity-clop of dress shoes clattering across the tiled floor at warp speed and knew help was soon to arrive. I reached over and picked up a paintbrush and said, This is a paintbrush, you know. These fine bristles are all natural and can help bring your painting to life. Karen looked at me with wide eyes and a mouth open and prepared for the early arrival of many flying insects should they happen to be landing, and this brought on a two-foot stomp. What? What are you babbling about? I want you to find my things, she shouted, just as Judy and Katie rounded the corner of a Nile to see what all the shouting was about. Me. Oh, but where do you suppose they could be? I feigned innocence. Judy spoke first. What is going on here? Before life on this earth could draw a single breath, Crazy Lady let out a string of, This stupid jerk of a worker won't help me. He's been rude to me, attacked me with that paintbrush, and I want the manager. I want him fired for being too stupid to be working. They should have laws about people being too stupid to have jobs. I want my things found, and I want them for free for dealing with such an incompetent imbecile. I know the owner, and he will fire all of you if you do not help me. Judy looked back at me and then covered her mouth with her hand as she turned her face to keep from laughing. Katie, who is in her 40s and looks to be in her 20s, suppressed a chuckle and walked right up to me. She ran her finger down my cheek and said, You know, if you stay a little while, I might take you home with me. We could have a lot of fun, you and I. What? cried Karen, whose face went beet red and she took a step back from her cart while Judy ran off doing her best to not laugh. Hmm, that sounds like an employee's discount I want to explore, I said, seeing the knowing look in Katie's eyes. What the heck is going on here? Karen screamed. Are you serious? You, you, I want someone to call the owner right now, right this minute. This kind of behavior will not be tolerated in this store. I will have you both fired right now. Katie and I are about the same height, and when Katie kissed my ear, Karen just started hopping around like a mad rabbit stomping both her feet into the floor. The gal on the register and Judy came rushing to us, Judy with the store phone and said she was calling the owner. Karen grabbed the phone out of Judy's hand and was running in circles waiting for the call to go through. Then Katie's phone rang and, Mmm, don't go anywhere you, she purred to me. Katie answered the phone while looking at the crazy lady dead in the eyes. Yeah, I'm the manager and I'm the owner and yeah, this is my husband. And you know what? I don't want your business. I don't want you in my store. I don't want to sell you anything and I don't want your money. I do ban and I will ban anyone and everyone who is rude to one of my employees and you are banned. You will leave or I will call the police and have you arrested for accosting my husband. Oh yeah, he gets an employee's discount because I am the owner and I can give that discount to anyone I choose. 
Oh, the Karen was having none of it. Oh, this is BS. You just called her cell. I want the owner, and I want the owner here now. Katie looked at Judy and asked, Have you called them yet? Yeah, Judy said. They're on their way. A minute went by with the Karen stomping on the ground when two of our local officers came around the end aisle. Both officers knew Katie and Judy as they often got stuff for their wives on the way home from their shift, and so they rushed the Karen just as she threw the phone at me, hitting me in the chest. Both of the police officers were of the family pack variety and stood well over six foot. They handled Karen pretty easily and got handcuffs on her. One took her outside and Katie told the other that she just wanted her trespassed and knowing my wife, like everybody in town does, they didn't even ask me if I wanted to press charges. Katie was the boss and what she says goes. I took Katie around the waist and said, you can be quite the vixen when you want to be, can't you? She looked at me with soft eyes and said, nobody messes with my husband except me and in my own store to boot. Note, Katie and I have been married since she was 20 something and I was 40 something. It wasn't a love at first sight thing, it was a gradual meeting of the minds and meeting of the hearts. We were neighbors and just saw each other often and then we started having drinks at each other's house until we finally kissed. It was that first kiss that got the snowball rolling down the hill and a year later we were married. Her family was not really happy with her marrying an older man and they let us know it at every opportunity so we moved to a different town in a faraway state. My family had thought that I had lost my mind and it was a relief to be so far away from them too. I'd never married up to that point, and while it's hard to explain, after that first kiss we just knew right then that we'd one day be married and began to plan for it. I'd saved up quite a bit of money for my paintings and we both worked, me at a forge and her in retail. I sold my house and that left us with a nice little nest egg so that when the store went on the market, Katie jumped at it and she's been running that store for over a decade now. Her income was enough that I could quit the forge and paint full time and be a house husband for our two kids who are now both out of high school. Our marriage now is stronger than it ever has been and our oldest is planning her own wedding. My wife has a number of stories about Karens and Chads in the wild and I might write up some of those in the future if folks like this. Do any of you guys like to paint? And if so, what kind of paintings do you do? Please let me know. I prefer crayons, but that's just me. Friend tells me he wants to spend more time with my girlfriend and that I spend too much time with her. This guy has been a problem from the start, but this was when I finally had enough and went off on him. Let me give context first. Before my girlfriend and I were together, we were just friends and were friends before our friend. We'll call him Entitled Dude. He instantly liked her and we both knew it. She wasn't ready for a relationship at the time, so wanted to just be friends with him. This is where the trouble started. Girlfriend and Entitled Dude became good friends, but he wanted something more and noticed that me and my girlfriend, again, she wasn't my girlfriend at the time, but I want to refer to her as such anyways, were getting closer and would hang out when it was just the two of us. He made comments before and joked that we were close, which I always thought was weird to bring up out of the blue, but always left it alone because I knew he was just jealous and I didn't want to argue with him. During the summer of the following year, me and girlfriend got even closer and in a drunken state one night, girlfriend confessed she liked me so much she wanted to be my girlfriend and I confessed right back because I liked her a lot too. We were both new to dating a person of the same gender so we kept it a secret until it was clear that's what we both wanted. It wasn't long though before our friend group found out and this includes Entitled Dude. He must have gained some real nerve to try and talk to me the way he did that night. The night I finally ended our friendship, I might add. He started off joking about my relationship with a girlfriend, but so aggressive and super fast, and I had enough and asked if he had a problem with me and to tell me everything he feels about me. This is how it went. Entitled Dude Yeah, I have a problem with you, and so does everyone else. Meaning people we barely know and don't even consider them to be a part of our friend group. You always hang out with your girlfriend, and she never hangs out with us, or me hardly anymore, and that's just not fair. Me. Excuse me? Me and girlfriend hardly know the people you just listed, and why should I have to share my girlfriend with you? Because she's my friend too, and everyone wants to hang out with her, and all you do is steal her away. Me. First off, no one that we consider real friends gives a flying hoot what me and my girlfriend do together, and how much time we spend together, 
So get off your high horse with that BS. Secondly, she's my girlfriend and we love to spend a lot of time together. We really do. And thirdly, never ever talk to me like I owe you something or that she owes you something. All you do when you talk to me is try and start crap with me and I always let it go and give you more chances that maybe you won't start anything with me. But now I'm at my limit. All you've ever done is choose to be mad at me for stupid reasons and I didn't even do anything to hurt you. I know why you're doing this, because you're jealous she's with me and not you. Well, guess what? That's because she likes me for me and I'm not sorry for that. I'm not sorry for being myself around her and that she wanted to hang out with just me. I didn't steal her away from anyone. She wanted it to be just the two of us. I don't blame her either because I wanted it to just be the two of us too because I liked her just as much as she liked me before and after we started dating. I am not sorry for loving her and that she loves me. So you can take your sorry excuses of an argument and get the heck out of me and my girlfriend's life right now because we don't want you as a friend any longer. I should add that we had this argument and that I yelled that last part while all of us were hanging out with our friends, including in front of my girlfriend. I don't usually allow myself to get that mad because I don't like people seeing me get mad from past anger issue problems and especially in front of my girlfriend. He tried saying more to me but was shut down instantly by my girlfriend and told him to leave. I've told her before of how he's tried to start arguments with me in the past and she usually told me go off on him and to not let him talk to me the way he wanted to. Well, now she knew why I never went off on him before. I was on the verge of getting violent and having a meltdown. Getting angry only brings me pain because it's been hard for me to control it my whole life so I was struggling after that whole ordeal. She and all our friends had my back and helped me through my rage and calmed me down. None of us talked to Entitled Dude to this day and it's been two years since I last spoke to him. What would you say to Entitled Dude if you were in this position? Would you put him in his place like OP did? Please let me know. He did nothing wrong. He reminds me of my son. You can't see, you can't play. Backstory. The entitled parent of this story is my cousin. I'll call her Hannah in this story. Hannah and I are only a year apart in age, so we were close as kids. I was born with an eye condition called optic nerve hypoplasia, or ONH for short. My eyesight isn't great, but it's my normal. I really hate the ignorant questions of, if you can't see, how are you using a computer or phone? I don't mind if people are genuinely curious, but some people just assume blind slash visually impaired people are incapable of doing things. For anyone curious, I'm using a program called Zoom Text on my laptop. Even though Hannah is an entitled mom, I love her kid. I have nothing against him. Hannah had him at a very young age, so I've tried to support her in any way I can. This happened during November, so not too long ago. On with the story. I had been wanting to buy a Nintendo Switch for a while now, and in November I finally did. I couldn't afford a new one, so I found a pretty good deal on a used one. I love my Switch. And since I know I won't be able to replace or fix it if something happens to it, I don't really let anyone else use it. I used my own money to buy it and it's my first console since I bought my 3DS a long time ago. One day, Hannah and her son, we'll call him Caleb, come to visit. Hannah had just bought Caleb a 2DS XL, which Caleb was excited to show me. He was five during this event. Hannah was very proud that she managed to buy him a brand new 2DS from the store. I was happy for him as well. This is where the situation turns sour. Here we go. Hannah. So, whatever happened to your DS? Me. It's still in my room, though I haven't been playing it much recently. Oh, why? Caleb loves his. I bought him several games already. Do you have any old games he can have if you aren't using them? Me. He can borrow some, sure. I don't have a lot of games though. I've been playing my Switch more recently. You have a Switch? Can we see it? Caleb. Me see. Me. Fine, but I only have Pokemon Shield on it. I get up and head into my room, grab my Switch from the dock, and return to the living room where Hannah and Caleb were waiting. Caleb puts down his 2DS and runs up to me excitedly. I sit down and he jumps onto the couch beside me, grabbing for my Switch. I let him hold it since I'm watching him and the floor is carpet. How much harm could he do? I turn the switch on so Caleb and Hannah can see how it looks, how it works, etc. Hannah. I was thinking about buying one for Caleb. Me. Didn't you just buy the DS like a week ago? Yeah, 
but he really wants a Switch. Now, I do need to explain something. I can't really use my Switch in handheld too well. The font is very small, and I have to struggle to see what I'm doing. My Switch is usually connected to the dock anyway. Hannah, noticing my struggle to see the screen as I'm showing them different features, speaks up. You can't even see what you're doing. Why did you buy it? Me. I can see it while it's on the dock, so it's fine. I worked for the money, and I haven't bought myself anything in a while. You bought something you can't even use. How much was it? Me. $250. The dude was pretty nice, and I got a good deal. Don't you think that's unfair? Someone who actually could have used it more would have loved to get it for that much. I could have gotten it for Caleb. Me. Well, I wanted it. I got it, and it's mine. Caleb, at this point, is still enjoying moving my character around in Pokemon. Hannah is quiet for a minute, then speaks. Caleb, don't you want to switch too? Caleb, yeah. Hannah, ask your cousin if you can have this one. Caleb, can I have your switch? He couldn't say switch. Me, ask your mommy to buy you one. Hannah, okay, fine. I'll give you $100 and then another $50 when I get paid in two weeks. Me, first of all, that's $100 less than I paid for it. Secondly, I'm not selling it. Caleb, please. Hannah, he's going to cry for it when we leave thanks to you. It can be his early Christmas present. I take my switch from Caleb and put it back in my room. Caleb is upset but returns to his DS. Hannah, so you seriously won't give it to him? He can actually use it properly. It's pretty useless if you can't take it with you everywhere. Me, I said no, Hannah. Now stop asking. Then can he borrow it? No. Things were pretty icy for the rest of her visit. Caleb did get slightly upset when they left, but he didn't throw a fit or anything. Hannah did attempt to guilt me that night on the phone. Hannah, Caleb is so upset. He's been crying all day because he really wants the switch. You know how hard things are for me. I'm a single mom trying to raise him by myself. I don't have money to spend like that. You do. You can find another one. You can't even use it. It deserves to go to someone who can actually use it. She still attempts to guilt me at times over the Switch and some other things I have. I do feel a bit guilty, but at the same time, I don't. She doesn't call him her darling angel or anything I see in most entitled parent stories. She just attempts to use my condition as justification that I don't need certain things I have. I hope this wasn't too long. I know this isn't a crazy event or anything, but I didn't want to exaggerate the details just to make it seem crazier. Do any of you guys have a Switch? If so, what games do you have for it? Please let me know. I've got a few myself. I have a strange hobby of taking them from people. New employee steals food from disabled girl. We have a female client at our day center who, unlike the other members, gets her breakfast prepared for her at the center as well as her packed lunch. She always has supplies such as tortillas, eggs, cheese, and meat sitting in the bottom drawer of the fridge to be used daily for her breakfast. The provider who works with her that day will cook up a breakfast burrito for her, and all of the materials are clearly labeled in the thick black sharpie with her name. Since different supplies empty at different rates, and it's difficult to constantly keep inventory of everything that needs to be replaced, the supervisor will often purchase supplies to replenish the ones that have emptied the morning of, and bill the client's mother for them later using receipts. The supervisor also keeps certain things in the office stocked for general use, such as coffee, creamer, and condiments. We had recently hired a new employee to the center who was experienced and worked really well with this particular female client. Typically, the supervisor will schedule members in a way where they have a variety of staff members working with them so they don't get too stuck on one particular person and refuse to work with anyone else. After a while, the new employee started asking to work with this female client fairly consistently and my supervisor had no problem allowing her to do so since they seemed to get along so well and the new employee didn't work every day. After several months, there was suddenly an increase in how often the supervisor had to go replenish items from this client's stock and she found it odd that said client was suddenly going through the same amount of food at a much faster pace than before. All of the staff claimed they had seen her eating the same food portions every day for breakfast. Providers started keeping an eye out to see where the food was mysteriously disappearing to. After some investigation, it was discovered that the new employee had been making her own meals from the food provided for this client. 
Her excuse? She had two. One, she said she didn't have a lot of money and couldn't afford to pay for her own lunch every day. Two, she said that since the supervisor was paying for the food, then it was fine for her to take it. She argued that since the client's mom wasn't directly paying for the food, it didn't belong to her client, but rather to the center instead, and staff should be allowed to eat it for that reason. She got a write-up and a swift reprimand from the manager, and so far as we know, she hasn't been stealing the food that belongs to the clients anymore. However, we do have another part-time employee who brings in freezer lunches every now and then and tries to keep them in the staff freezer to eat for the days she will be at the center. It has happened numerous times that these frozen lunches disappear and the part-time employee ends up going hungry because that's all they prepared to eat that day and they can't afford to get anything else. I've spoken to the troublesome employee since the earlier debacle and she's still under the belief that other people owe her food just because she can't afford to pay it for herself. I constantly see her trying to mooch off of other staff and even several disabled members who are more cognitive but still lack the wherewithal to say no to her when she asks for part of their lunch. I can't help but think she's the one stealing the frozen lunches from our coworker. Has anybody ever stolen food from you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let me know. Few things taste better than a stolen lunch. First come, first serve, lady. I was grabbing some stuff at the local Target in a red t-shirt. As I was rolling into the frozen food section, I noticed little old lady trying to get a package of toilet paper off the top shelf. I offered to assist her. She declined and I moved down the aisle. When I came back up the other side, there was now a little old lady and a Karen now trying to get it first. She quickly started calling me over, demanding I get that package down for her and refused to accept that I didn't work there. So I reached up to the top shelf, grabbed the package of toilet paper, and handed it to the little old lady. Karen went nuts at this point, trying to reach up and take it out of the little old lady's hands. I stepped in the middle and told her that little old lady was trying to get it before I went down the aisle and had declined my assistance to get it. As she reached up to push me out of the way, I told her that if she touched me, I would have to ensure she was kept there while I pressed charges. I'm not exactly a big guy, but I am 6 feet and 230 pounds and in fairly decent shape and my try me face is on point. She backed off and huffed off. I thought it was over. Wrong. I went my own way and part of the way down the next aisle I hear little old lady and Karen yelling. I peek around the aisle. Karen now has Karen Jr. with her and Karen Jr. is blocking little old lady from getting to her cart while Karen is grabbing the toilet paper. I don't know why I got back involved. Karen just had me all sorts of mad. I go to Karen's cart and stand between Karen and her cart. Karen is yelling that she is going to get my manager. I welcomed her to do so. She finally decided it was worth pushing me. I grab the toilet paper out of her arm, grab my phone, I'm calling the police. I'm moderately hearing impaired and my hearing aids connect to my phone, so I put my phone in my back pocket. While on the phone with 911, Karen thinks I'm talking to myself at this point and tries again to remove the toilet paper from my arms. I just start towards the checkout and ask little old lady to follow me. Karen and Karen Jr. now both are trying to pull it out of my arm. At this point, manager shows up. Karen starts yelling that I'm being rude and trying to interfere with her shopping for my own gain. Manager asks me why I'm not helping Karen. I told him I didn't even work there then filled him in on what had happened, starting with little old lady trying to get the toilet paper, refused help, Karen tried to swipe it, got violent when I helped little old lady since she was the first one, and that the police are on their way. And then I pointed out I was still on the phone with dispatch. Manager, little old lady, and Karen all looked confused at this point. I told them about my hearing aids, and Karen turned pale. All of the conversation and threats were on the 911 recording, and she just realized it. Midway through the conversation, the cop showed up. He asked for all of the stories, went and reviewed the videos. I then told him I wanted to press charges. Karen and Karen Jr. left in cuffs. Little old lady got her toilet paper and I was late for dinner. Sometimes Karens really do get what they deserve. You know what you deserve, Mr. Reddit? What's that? A thumbs up on this video. My mom thinks my sister is entitled to my grandparents' will. So this is a generally long story, dating back about 8 or 9 years ago from the beginning until now. So bit of context and backstory here. My father's side of the family, nanny and granddaddy, are quite wealthy and well off. They own practically an entire city. 
The land belonged to my grandfather's parents and was split between him and his two siblings, all adopted. This left him at about $2.8 billion in worth after he passed away in 2017. So my sister and I were pretty well off in our financial areas in life, as were my half-brother and all of our cousins, second cousins, and our aunt and dad. So come about nine years or so ago, my sister set out for college, which she could attend for about two years on her own because of her grades. Our mom gave her her car, moms, and my grandparents decided to graciously pay for all of my sister's expenses, her apartment, her food, her transportation, any extra classes she was supposed to take slash wanted to take, and in general, everything she needed or wanted. So, throughout about four or five years of college, they paid for her switching classes two or three times, sent her checks monthly for food and transportation, bought her books for her, and gave her extra in case she needed it. She chose to spend almost all of this money going out and partying with her friends, taking them out to expensive restaurants for dinner and hauling them around wherever they wanted to go. Well, sometime in between her years there, she got 12000 back from something that happened there. Housing payment roll back, I think, not sure. That belonged to my grandparents. She wasted all of that partying and living it up with her friends without ever bothering to ask who it belonged to or checking in with anybody first. My grandparents weren't happy about the money she stole from them. She was supposed to send it back to them. By the end of her college, when she was supposed to graduate, everyone came to visit her. All of our great aunts, great uncles, cousins, a lot of people. We're talking maybe 20 people. Most of them were elderly and many didn't even live in our state. They had to fly and book hotels and extra transport costs. Pretty sure my grandparents paid for all of that for them to celebrate her graduation. And this included my grandma and grandpa themselves. My grandpa was strapped to an oxygen tank and wasn't able to move much. He was wheelchair bound and his health was already ailing by the time she graduated. And her college was high up in the mountains, so it wasn't easy for him to be there to begin with, let alone the nine hour drive it took to get up there for them and everyone else who came. So they all attended her graduation and my sister had a mental breakdown, conveniently, and decided to say, forget everyone else. She talked to our dad and his wife and that was it. She blew everyone else off. She wouldn't talk to our grandparents. She wouldn't talk to anyone else who came up to see her. She just ignored all of them and left the campus. I spent time with my grandparents and some of our great aunts and uncles in her stead because holy crap, she was so rude. Even I hate her for that. And then I left with our mom to help her finish packing the apartment up so she could move back down. Well, our grandparents and family had a special party planned for her and she knew this, but instead of going to see any of them or even attending her part that they paid a lot of money to set up for her, she went to visit our dad instead and then left back towards the city, completely bypassing them all and didn't give a single hoot about it. So she ends up a little ways down the road getting a boyfriend. Our grandparents on mom's side of the family had already cut her off. Grandma was your typical old German woman Grandpa had already died of cancer long before any of this, and Nanny and Granddaddy were the only ones left she could show him off to. So we all went to visit them, and we went out to eat, and Nanny actually started talking crap about her right in her face while she was there, completely ignoring her existence, and went off about how she stole their money and how angry they were because of how disrespectful she had been to them, which I wholeheartedly agree with. My sister got upset and threw a tantrum and started crying. Mom started getting angry and lying about how it was her money and not my grandparents and that ended rather poorly. So my sister stopped visiting them because my grandma refused to give her any money when she visited but always gave me some. She used to always give us a few hundred for visiting and got very angry when I mentioned that my mom made me give my sister at least 100 to 200 of whatever nanny gave me after each visit after she cut my sister off. So Nanny told me to stop letting them know I had money from her, which granted was hard to do because she always gave me money and everyone knew it. But I guess she jumped on my mom about it because my mom stopped demanding I share eventually. They took it as offensive, or at least Nanny did, and that only made them angrier. Over the course of two or three more years, my grandpa's health got worse slowly and while I'd like to believe he forgave her or at least moved on and let it go, my grandma didn't. Eventually, October 2017 rolled around and my grandpa was dying. My sister finally went back to visit them, 
and this was only because he was dying and we forced her to come with us. He was kind to everyone, even her, and he passed away on the 17th, a few days after we had last visited. He had cut his oxygen supply off and let himself go after all family had gotten to say goodbye for the last time. So it was just Nanny now, and every time I visited her, I swear, she was going off about my sister stealing and being disrespectful and how my mom was trying to cover for her and I knew. I mean, it wasn't anything new to me, but eventually I did try to tell her gently that it wasn't worth clinging to because it'd only make her unhappy and miserable if she did. Money isn't everything, and they helped me see that over the years, so I tried to get her to lay off a bit and let it go, but she didn't want to. Well, Granddaddy had a will that granted all of us, my sister included, roughly $150,000 to $280,000 in a trust fund that will continue to grow over the years, will be accessible after Nanny dies, and I guess she still hasn't let this go three years later because we just got a letter in the mail saying that Nanny removed my sister from the will. I don't blame her for it. My sister is a real piece of work. She's money hungry, spoiled, just bad in general. She's our mom's little angel, so she gets away with everything and never cares about it. But my mom got so angry about it that she actually threatened to sue my grandma for removing my sister off of the will. And later, after calling my grandma and chickening out of going off on her because Nanny is just one of those people you don't want to upset, she demanded that I share my portion of the will with my sister. I told her no. She's an idiot. My sister deserved this, and I'll never see it as otherwise. She only ever visited for money. She never bothered to speak to them. Whether they accepted her warmly or not didn't matter. She was extremely rude and never felt any remorse for her actions. I don't blame her for removing my sister. It's her money and her right to remove my sister if she wants to. My mom is stupid for wanting to fight her in court over it. My mom never saw a problem with how disrespectful and rude my sister had been and continues to be, and that's why she was removed. My grandma says granddaddy did it before he passed. Whether that's true or not, I doubt it honestly. But in any case, I don't blame her. My sister is like my parents. Both are money hungry, rude, and uncaring people. If you were in this position, would you share your inheritance with your sister? And why or why not? Please let me know. She better. Her sister deserves it more. She reminds me of a younger version of myself. Entitled mom loses everything. Almost. So this happened before lockdown. My mother, entitled mom, wasn't always that bad. It began about two years ago when my grandpa, her father, died. Her mother died one year earlier. My grandparents on my dad's side both still lived and were as healthy as always and both a few years older than my other grandparents. My mother was heartbroken and suddenly changed. She always wanted to be in control of everything, so I spent more time away to study for my finals. But enough backstory. Let's get on with the story. Our cast. We've got my dad, we've got my younger sister, we've got my entitled mom, we've got my loving and caring girlfriend, and we've got me. Let's start. I was 18 at the time. I was coming home from the library with my girlfriend because it was pretty late and I wanted to drive her home. I walk because it's less than 2 kilometers. It was a hard day for both of us, but the worst part was yet to come. We just wanted to quickly get in my car and drive her home. One problem. My car was missing. My dad was home and my sister wasn't allowed to drive, so it was quite obvious who took it. We had to wait for entitled mom because my dad's car was in a mechanic's garage. We waited for two hours before my very drunk mother drove into the garage. I have no idea how she managed to do that and got out. I asked her why she took my car and she responded with, You jerk! You believe you have a right to my car? I didn't answer because I tried not to burst into laughter because of what she had called me. I drove my girlfriend home and drove back just to be greeted by dad. Dad, we have to talk. Me, about what? Dad, about your mother. Me, can't that wait until tomorrow? It can't. Why? Because your mother is asleep. So then I followed him to the living room where my sister sat who looked just as confused as I felt. Dad, so this morning I found an email. Sis and me, why is that so important? Dad, see for yourself. He then showed us the email. Sis, what is that dad? A brand new Mustang bought from my credit card by Entitled Mom. Me, so she stole from you? Dad, this isn't the first time. 
We then spent the next half hour looking at emails which my dad received. Me, with calculator in hand. This adds up to more than half a million. Dad, and that is just the last 10 years. Me, why didn't you do anything, Dad? In the first few years, it only was a few thousand euros. But when you, speaking to me, came to the world, she suddenly bought more. It got way worse after her parents died. I couldn't leave her without risking that you would fall into her hands. I could not have allowed that. But now, I recently fixed some things at the bank. I have a new credit card and can block my old one by command. As you know, your mother doesn't have much on her credit card. Sis, so you plan to go through a divorce and then bring her to court for theft? Dad, exactly. I can save sister from entitled mom and OP can either stay with us or go his own way. Me, that's a great plan, dad. And so it happened, I left the family to live with my girlfriend. My dad and mom divorced and he got full custody and because of the proof that she stole from him, he had to give nothing to her. But because he is a great person, he gave her enough money to buy a decent house. But he went to court and she had to pay him all the money she stole from him, 650,000 euro. Dad and his new girlfriend plan to get married soon and sis recently moved out. I, on the other hand, am planning the wedding for me and my girlfriend. I don't blame entitled mom for her behavior. I still plan to invite her to my wedding because I have faith in humanity and hope she will change. Do you think Karen got what she deserved or do you think she got off too lightly? Let me know. She did nothing wrong. The purpose of money is to spend it and that's all she was doing. The weirdest customer I've ever had. This story took place in an electronic parts retail store. I am quite proud to have specialized myself in both the parts and house audio departments. This story is in the house audio department. Two customers approached in the department. Since they had no distinction from each other, I will refer to them as them. Their demand was rather odd. Them. We have a party in five days and need materials, lots of it. At this point, I was the new guy and saw the opportunity to make my first huge sale. Me. Okay, what exactly do you need? Them. Well, we want lots of huge speakers all linked together. Me. Okay, sure thing. I sold them five $250 speakers plus $70 worth of cables. Them. At some point during the party, we're going to have a small band playing. I sold them a mixing table and two microphones with stands for a total of $600. They wanted the best we had. Them. They will be playing music from two different devices, laptops, and it needs to switch from one device to the other at the end of each song. Me. Why? Them. Because we want one song to play from my computer, then one song from his, the other guy's computer. Me. Why don't you put both music inside one device into a playlist? Them. Because I don't want to be stuck with his music in my computer after the party. Me. Well, you can delete it after the party. Them. I don't want him to lose his music. Me. Then make a copy in your computer, then delete the copy. Them. Sir, let me be more clear. You want your sale? You're at my service. Me. Well, of course I am. You couldn't be more right. I'm just trying to recommend you the best and cheapest solution, but it does require some effort and work from your side. Big mistake. Them. Sir, right now you work for me. We ask you stuff and you make sure we get what we want. Me. Sir, I don't work for you. I work for the store. I answer to my boss's demands, which is to serve his customers. I am at your service, but I do not work for you. Them. Okay, we're getting sidetracked. How can we make so that when the song on one device ends, it automatically switches to the other device? Me. You cannot. You'd have to manually switch the volumes of both inputs from the mixing table. Such a device does not exist, I'm afraid. The best you could do is have someone stationed there to do it. Them. Like a DJ? Me. Yes, but since it's just reversing two input volumes, no need to hire a DJ. The best solution, from the information of what you are willing to do, would be to station one of you or your guests to do it. Them. No, the party is for everyone, including me. I can't be spending all my time at the mixing table just to switch volumes. Me. Then hire a DJ. My cousin does part-time DJ. He's good. They actually hired my cousin for this. That's $200 they had to spend on him. He charges $30 an hour plus transportation. Them. Okay, how can we know the device from which the song is playing? Me. 
Well, you could check directly on the computers, or on the mixing table, or simply by recognizing your music from his. Them. Well, we'll need to add headphones onto the mixing table. If it plays in the left ear, it'll be computer number one. Me. Sir, you just need to check which volume is up on the them interrupting me. Sir, you are at our service. We have a demand. Now you find a solution for it. Me. Sir, what I'm trying to say is that we can only set the pan. Pan is the left-right output to speakers. Most of the time, it's in the middle, so the left speakers are as loud as the right ones. And the pan is for the output. You could use the pan, but Computer 1's music will only play on the left speakers and Computer 2's music on the right speakers. It's completely ridiculous. Plus, you're hiring a DJ. He could fill you in on that. Them. We do not know this guy, and we don't trust him enough. Me. But you're hiring him. How can you hire him if you don't trust him? Them. Well, he doesn't know the material. Me. Neither do you. You're buying them right now. You've never used them before. My cousin knows his stuff since he's recommended my boss to buy them for the store. Not true, but I needed a convincing argument. At this point, my friend, who taught me all I know about house audio, came in and just started agreeing with everything he said just so we could move on. Now came all the audio adapters they needed. They bought $40 worth of adapters. In this store, an adapter costs from 50 cents to $1.50, depending on it. In other words, they bought from 28 to 80 different adapters. They demanded that we test everything before they pay for it. We plugged everything and it all worked perfectly. In this store, they have a special policy. If a product was tested in store, no refund. And if it's audio equipment, no refund. Everything was tested. Their bill got up to $2,400. My first huge sale. I got patted on the back for that. It was the biggest sale I've made when I worked there. The day after their party, they tried to return everything. They claimed that nothing worked. I called my cousin. He said that his first hour of work was spent redoing all the cabling since everything was plugged in in the most messed up way possible. My boss spent two hours dealing with them saying that they could not return anything because of the previously mentioned policy. In a strange fit of rage, they left all their purchases at the front door and left the premise. Five Bluetooth speakers, some cables, lots of adapters, a mixing table, two microphones with their stands, and a nice pair of headphones, all barely used. My boss looked at me and said, Well, since they're considered used, I can only sell them at half the price, but since I technically cashed in on them, I can make you a price. I purchased all of this equipment for a quarter of the price with my 20% employee discount for a total of $480, a ripoff. I was happy and the boss was happy. If only they had listened when we told them no refund or read their receipt which also stated it. If only they weren't so lazy. If only they weren't so arrogant. If only they would have listened to me. And if only they weren't so weird. Maybe they would have paid 50% less and gotten an even better result. Who was the weirdest customer that you ever dealt with? I'd love to know. I feel bad for those customers. And that was terrible customer service. Entitled mom bashes dad's window in over me not coming home. So, a bit of background. This story happened when I was about 14 or 15. Me and my dad had recently met and started to bond. My grandparents had custody of me and allowed me to go to my dad's house literally any time I wanted so that I could have a real parent in my life. My mother wasn't happy about this because, well, she's my mom. She wasn't happy with any positive relationship I had with anyone especially if I wasn't jumping through hoops to make her happy. So during this time, my grandparents planned a vacation to Las Vegas. They gave me full permission to go stay at my dad's house for two weeks and they hired a sitter for my younger siblings in their home. Cast, we've got me, we've got dad, we've got entitled mom, my stepsister, my stepmom, and my baby sister. So it starts off as any regular day at my dad's house. Me and stepsister get up, do some chores around the house, play fight with a wet wash rag after washing dishes, the normal teenager life. Stepmom wakes up and makes breakfast while we play with baby sister. My dad is sleeping because it happens to be a weekend and he doesn't work weekends unless he gets called in. Well, if I didn't have such crappy cell service, I would have been able to warn all of them of the storm approaching. But I had no service at my dad's house, so I didn't receive any of the calls from entitled mom or my grandparents. Randomly, we hear a truck pull up in the front yard. It's entitled Mom's black truck. 
Stepmom. Is that your mom? Me. Uh, I guess so. Stepmom. I'm gonna go wake your dad up. A few minutes later, my dad is at the front door and he's talking to Entitled Mom. Entitled Mom. Tell your daughter to pack her crap and come on. Dad. No, we have permission for her to stay here while her grandparents are in Vegas. She's not going anywhere unless she wants to. My stepmom is whispering to me now. Stepmom. Do you want to go with your mom? It's okay if you do. We won't be angry with you. Me. No, I'd really like to stay, if that's okay. I really wanted to spend more time with you guys, so when school starts, I can stay here more on school days. Stepmom. That's perfectly fine with us. We're always happy to have you here. As long as you want to be here, we won't let anything happen to you. By this time, you can hear Entitled Mom going off. She's my daughter! I will call the police if you don't bring her out here right now. Dad, I'll go talk to her. Stay here. Slams the door in her face. Dad, do you want to go back with your mom? Stepmom, she said she'd like to stay here. We talked while you were handling her. Dad, you don't have to go anywhere. Do you want to tell her yourself that you want to stay? Me. Um, can you do it, please? I don't really want her to yell at me. She has a way of making me feel bad every time I try to talk to her. Dad. Of course. Maybe it's best if everyone goes to the back rooms. We all start moving towards the back of the house. All we can hear is screaming now. Entitled Mom. Where is that brat? Come out here right now. Calls me by my middle name. You aren't staying here. Dad. Get off my property. If you don't leave, I'm calling the police. My stepmom and stepsister hide me in the closet and give me a baseball bat. Entitled Mom. You can't keep her from me. She's my daughter. She has to come with me. All we hear after this is the sound of glass being smashed, something sounding like metal against metal, and then her truck taking off. Eventually, we all go outside to see all of the cars have their windows smashed in and the paint and sides are scraped up pretty bad. My dad, bless him, didn't call the cops. Not sure why. He did call my grandparents though, and they explained they had tried to contact to give me a heads up that Entitled Mom would be on her way over. Apparently, when they told her they gave me permission to stay with my dad while they were on vacation, she lost her mind. Everything was fine after that. We laughed it off and pretty much told stories of how crazy Entitled Mom has been, even before I was born. My dad said he wouldn't talk badly of her because he didn't believe in that, but said that this was the second time she smashed his windows and his truck in, and he told me that he doesn't hold any resentment towards her now, but she made his life heck after I was born. The stories my stepmom told me were pretty funny too. My entitled mom was so crazy, she didn't let them anywhere near me, so they'd have to get in contact with my aunts to find out when and where my sports tournaments were, or my concerts. Then they showed me videos of my games and concerts to show me that they had always been there for me even if I didn't know they existed. My entitled mom had told me at a young age that my dad died, so I had no idea I even had a dad until I was in middle school. Besides my entitled mom going crazy, it was a really nice day. I've always been grateful for them. My dad passed away a few months after I turned 18, so he's been gone for a few years. I've never forgiven my entitled mom for the time I missed out on with him. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed, and as usual, not word for word, just what I got from memory. This entitled mom was by far one of the worst we've ever read about. She really was. Not even I can stick up for her. No, I'm not a volunteer. I'm just being nice. This happened about four or five years ago, but I still remember it like it happened yesterday. I was just walking home from my bus station to our house. You should know that I was able to walk three different ways home. One through a creepy sideway, one past a playground, and one past a retirement home. That day, I was using the third option to get home. The location looked like this, a long walkway surrounded by some trees and bushes. At the end of that way started the property of the retirement home. So it was one of those days, my mom wasn't home until one hour after I was back, so I took it easy and walked slowly. I saw that the elders were outside, sitting and walking around the property like they do every noon between 12 and 3 p.m., I had my headphones on and was minding my own business when an elderly woman sitting on a bench reached her hand out for me to get my attention. I stopped, pulled out my headphones. She then asked me really nicely if I could walk her up and down the way for a bit because she was too weak to do it on her own. Because I had nothing better to do and my mom wasn't waiting for me, I said yes and helped her get up. After she got a good grip on me so she wouldn't just fall, 
we started to slowly walk up and down for maybe two times, talking about school, friends, and family. I had to repeat some things a few times because she instantly forgot almost everything I said when a woman stopped us. She was maybe 30 and had a big smile on her lips. Hey, Martha, she said to the old lady, not her real name, and patted her hand. I found out that she was a good friend of Martha's children and was living right beside the retirement home. Thank you so much for taking care of Martha. You volunteer guys are really nice and helpful. Here, have some money, the woman then said and wanted to give me 50 euros. But I stopped her and explained that I wasn't working there as a volunteer. I was just coming back from school and had some time left, so I thought it would be the right thing to do by helping her, I quickly said. The woman stared at me for a second and then started to laugh. Oh, I'm sorry, but it's really, really nice to know that there are actually still people left in your age who are being nice for free, even though Martha was a total stranger for you. I just smiled, so did Martha the whole time by the way, and declined the money once again before bringing Martha back to the property and going home, feeling extremely proud. I know, nothing wild and no police were called, but I thought I'd share it with you guys anyway. That was nice. Would you have helped her walk around for a bit, or would you have acted like you didn't hear her? Oh, come on. Where's the manager? Give me a story with the manager. Dislocated my shoulder to make a point. I've been working at a chain grocery store for almost two years, and this happened June of 2019, but I only remembered yesterday talking to my mom about working as a cashier. I thought this would be a funny story to share here. At the time, I was a full-time cashier and well-liked by my coworkers and most customers. I am known at work for being goofy, and I usually have a good story. I had dislocated my shoulder the first time at work, but it wasn't a full dislocation, so I just tucked it in my apron and carried on one-handed. I am nearly as fast one-handed as two. The next day, I finished the job by reaching too far around something and it popped out, and I had to push it back in. After that, it came out a few times and I just put it back in. This became pretty normal, so it isn't nearly as painful now, but still not fun. So this day I was on till and warned my boss I dislocated it again at home and would have to be careful with it, but I can still do my job. She knows me well enough that she isn't all that worried about me. A lady and her husband put their things on the belt, one of which is a big box of chicken breasts that I knew I shouldn't try to lift. I started ringing in their items and tried to make pleasant conversation. She was ignoring me and her husband was taking a phone call. I just continued thinking they were preoccupied. When I finally got to the box, I said, I'm sorry, miss, but I hurt my arm and can't lift the box of chicken breast. I've already... She cut me off before I could finish. Just do your job, she snapped. I tried to explain what had happened, but she kept arguing. Apparently, one of the other cashiers heard what was going on and called my boss down from the office. She came to the till next to me and asked, Is there a problem here? Yes, your cashier is refusing to do her job. Tell her to do her job. I'm not paying for her to be lazy and ask me to do her job. Okay, lady. My boss started talking about how she needs to not talk to her staff like that, and she tried explaining why I can't lift it. I turned to my boss and said, It's fine, watch this. I turned back to the customer and smiled. I picked up the box in kind of a weird angle to make sure I dislocate it, and put the box on the other side of the till. I looked her dead in the eye, rested my elbow on the register, lined it up, and put it back in with my other hand. It made a loud pop sound. She turned white and walked out of the store. I assumed to vomit or hide, but her husband stayed. I didn't even notice that he finished his call just before I lifted the box. He came over and asked if I was all right. I said I was fine and asked how he was paying with a big grin on my face. He paid and left smiling pretty big himself. I have a funny feeling this is a pretty regular occurrence for her. Why do so many Karens refuse to listen to the cashier? Because they never have anything worth listening to. You want to cancel your service, Karen? Okay, you get no internet for the next two plus years. Background. I worked for an internet service provider in Australia called iNet. We were at the time one of the biggest providers, but crucially, we did not own our ADSL1 network and we only onsold the ADSL1 service from the biggest provider in the country. Telstra. We also had a policy that an ongoing issue should have a case owner, and I was the case owner for this, which is why I got multiple calls about it. Act 1. A Wild Karen Appears I get a call from a Karen. While doing an ID check, she provides me her age, and of course, she's in her 40s. 
Her internet went down. I look at the account and I can see she's got unsold Telstra service. One thing catches my eye. Although there are thousands of exchanges, central place your connection goes to, shared by multiple suburbs, in the country and you can't possibly know them all, I know the one she is on because a few weeks earlier a friend was considering buying a house in the area and I looked at this one and found out that there are no free ports and thus it is impossible to get a new service connected. The waiting list for a new connection was two and a half years at least. So I asked her to do the troubleshooting steps and she says she does, but I suspect she's just telling me she is doing it to make me go away. Whatever, nothing I can do about that. We exhaust all the troubleshooting and I tell her there appears to be a line fault. I can send out a technician, but it will take three to five working days, and if there is actually nothing wrong with the line, she will be charged $199 plus $40. Numbers might be wrong, it was a while back, but it was at least $200 for every 15 minutes of work to cover technician's time. I play her the disclaimer that outlines this, and she says, yeah, I accept. On the recording, I lodge a fault. Act 2, The Fault, in our loop. She calls after two days, sounding annoyed things are still offline. I tell her it hasn't been five days. She hangs up. On the fifth day, I get a technician's report saying, no fault found. Next day she calls, Karen. So, my connection is still offline. It has been five days. What's happening? Me. Well, the technician attended the fault and his report says, no fault found. Karen. What? That's BS. The internet is clearly down and you need to fix it. Me. I don't doubt that the internet is offline, but the fault does not appear to lie within our area of responsibility. I would suggest you check your local equipment. Karen. That's not true. My son is an IT guy and the router is brand new. Me. Okay. Well, I can't speak for the state of your equipment, but our equipment appears to be in working order. Incidentally, I just want to make sure to give you a heads up that we will be placing an incorrect call-out fee on your next invoice. You're lying to me. I didn't see no technicians. And now you want to charge me over $200 based on your lies? I won't let that happen. Me. I assure you, the technician attended the reported fault. However, you did not see them because they probably only went to the exchange, which is approximately 4 kilometers away from you. Karen. You're lying to me. I am not paying the fee. What can I do now? Me. Well, if you are that adamant that your equipment is not at fault, your only option is to file another fault and send the tech out again. It is fairly rare, but it is not impossible the technician was wrong. Karen. And then you'll pretend you send the tech and charge me another incorrect call-out fee. Me. We will most definitely send out another tech, but yes, it is very likely to come back as another NFF, and in that case, a further fee is likely. That's BS. I have been with you for five plus years, and this is how you treat me? Cancel my service now. I will go to your competitors. They'll want my money. Me. Ma'am, the exchange you're connected to only has Telstra ports and is at 100% utilization. If I cancel your service, you will lose your spot. It is unlikely any of our competitors will be able to provide you any service at all. You should just transfer your service to the next provider, so-called churn. This will allow her to keep her spot. Don't tell me what to do, you lying jerk. You will cancel my service now, or I will do everything in my power to have you fired. Now I'm upset myself. It's a crappy situation, but there's no need to take it out on me. I'm trying to help her, and that's her response? Engage malicious compliance. Me. Okay, ma'am. Hold on for a moment. I'm canceling your service. Okay. Cancellation processed. Let me just remind you that the incorrect callout fee is still due. You won't see a cent of that. Me. Noted. But the amount is over collections threshold, so we will send you to collections. Karen hangs up. Act 3. The Joys of the Waiting List About a month later, I get a request to transfer to me. It's Karen. I take a moment to catch up on her file and the service is cancelled and fee invoiced. I run a quick service qualification on her line and I can see that our service, so-called codes, have dropped off and there are no other codes on her line. She did not manage to get connected with anyone. Karen. Hello, I think I spoke to you last time. Yes, you did. My internet is still down and you are still charging me for the fee. I need you to get rid of it. Me. 
I cannot do that. The charge is valid. Well, I can't pay it. You've ruined my business. I was operating an e-commerce business, and that won't be possible anytime soon. Running a business over residential connection is a breach of customer service agreement, but I let that slide. Me. I am sorry for your predicament, but the fee stands. I'll do you a deal. If you reconnect my service, I will pay the fee. Me. I can probably sign you up again, even though you're behind on payment, but I was not lying to you when I told you that there are no ports on your exchange. It is very unlikely you would get a port. They're all in use. Did you try with our competitors as you said you would? I did. None of them would even try signing me up because they told me they couldn't provide service. Me. We are in the same situation. Why can't you just give me my old spot back? Me. Because it was given to the first person on the waiting list. And how long does the waiting list take? Last I checked, more than two years. This is ridiculous. I'm going to TIO. Me. You may do so, as is your right. But to be very clear, we will substantiate the validity of our fee. Whatever. She hangs up. Conclusion. She did in fact file a complaint with TIO, and I handed her case over to a TIO complaint specialist. I made sure to point out that she was breaching terms of service with business over residential service. TIO obviously ruled in our favor, and we were allowed to send her to actual collections. Before I left the company, about a year and a half later, I caught up on her file and she had filed a loss of business claim, which was summarily closed because residential connections have no service level agreement. Last contact was her speaking to our credit team, asking them to make sure they mark her debt as paid with our collections people and make sure this is reflected on her credit rating. There were still no codes on her line. It is quite unlikely she got any reasonably priced service connected for at least two years, realistically longer, as demand only ever went up. How mad do you get when your internet goes out? And would you ever lose your temper on the tech support over the phone? Please let me know. All she had to do was ask for a manager. They would have fixed it right away. This is my painting. Okay, today I have my own story. If you've read another of my stories, you know that my wife works and owns a hobby store and I paint landscapes on canvas. I always have to say canvas because some people don't seem to make the connection between painting and a canvas and they ask if I'm into landscaping. Maybe I can see where they might think I do landscaping because I paint landscapes but when I try to explain that I paint, they think I somehow paint the yard with plants. I don't know if that's a thing, maybe so. But I now always am careful to explain that I paint landscapes on canvas to try and head confusion off at the pass. So on to my story. I was invited to create five or so paintings to be hung for a special event at a local art gallery. Other artists would also be showing their work and to expect that I could sell all my pieces. I paint, almost exclusively, on 18 by 24 canvases and only paint on other sized canvases for a request or if I feel inspired by something. I live in the West slash Southwest and there is never a shortage of things for me to find inspiration from. Also, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and so I have those memories to draw from as well. So I painted a greenish woodland scene, a swampy scene, a desert scene, a seascape and river scene with tall sandstone cliffs. The river scene is what this story is about and so I'll go into more detail about it. It is a faster moving river that begins in the left top quadrant of the canvas, winds down to the middle of the canvas and loops back to the lower left quadrant. On the right hand side are sandstone bluffs with some vegetation and there's a spit of land that allows for the river to loop around to the left. The spit of land has trees, bushes, driftwood, rocks, what you would normally find along a river in the Pacific Northwest. However, the scene is more attuned to the southwest with the desert-like sandstone cliffs and rocks. The whole painting is truly a figment of my imagination and parts got painted over and repainted a few times before I got what I wanted. This is important. I used Douglas fir trees on my spit of land, none of which grow in the southwest, and I used cacti to break up the rock on the right side. I also used huckleberry and rhododendron bushes on the spit both native to the Pacific Northwest and can't be found in the Southwest. This is also important. The painting is called Wondering. So the day of the opening is at hand and I never dress up much. For me, a pair of pressed jeans, cowboy boots, a white shirt with tie and I'm all set. I'm 60-ish and gravity has forced my body such 
that all the nice muscles in my shoulders have drooped down to around my waist. My wife still loves me, but I sometimes think she longs for the younger me. Most everyone else is dressed up, and that includes my wife, who loves these events as an excuse to dress to the nines. You ladies know what I mean. Long evening gown, matching clutch purse, matching high heels, hair all done up, three hours before the makeup mirror. Just kidding on the makeup mirror. I think it was only two hours and a quarter. We wandered around the different exhibits, and I marveled at the talent that is before me. It's hard for me to accept that I am any good, even when people tell me, because, well, it's just hard. My wife's siblings are always begging me for paintings to hang on their walls, but I try to put them off and let my wife decide. So I'm standing in front of wondering and finding all the places where I think there is a mistake and how the lighting isn't quite right when this woman walks up to stand next to me. Don't you hate it when the artist just finds some picture on the internet and copies it? I just saw this picture on a magazine in the airport not too long ago, she said in a high nasal tone. I looked at her and she was too done up to the nines with a glass of something bubbly in her hands. She looked to be in her 30s, but then I am terrible judge of age. Her face looked like someone had smashed it in with a canoe paddle. Indeed? I asked. Yeah, I see it everywhere. Artists nowadays have no imagination. They just copy. This woman wore a dark blue paint suit with a white blouse and probably stood five foot two with an extra third grader around her waist. I'm not condemning her for having the equivalent of a third grader's weight around her waist. It's just an observation. And you're sure you saw this on a magazine cover somewhere? I asked. Oh yes, I'm very sure of that. Hmm. The reason I ask is that if you notice, this is a southwestern scene, but there are elements in it that you would not find in the southwest, like those trees and these bushes. I gently probed. She looked closer and said, Oh no, I see those everywhere around here. I think I might even have some growing in my own yard. I thought to myself, she's delusional or tripping on LSD or something. Just then, my wife shows up and gives me my water as she sips her bubbly drink. What do you think of the lighting? She asks. Hmm, maybe a little soft for this one. I'm not sure. My wife went from facing the pitcher to facing me. OP, she started, grabbing my chin so that I was now looking at her. Where are you? Me. Huh? My wife. When you say you're not sure, that's my cue that you are far, far away in another galaxy. Before I could answer, this other lady murmurs, And this price! Where do these artists get that anybody is going to pay that price for a copy of something else? Katie's eyes got big around, and her head turned to one side as she looked around my shoulders at the woman on the other side of me. You think it's overpriced, do you? Overpriced? A ten-year-old could make this. What does this artist do? Rip out pictures from magazines and then just copy them? Really, no imagination at all. There should be a law banning this kind of ineptitude. The woman said this with disgust in her voice. Katie seemed to falter, and then her eyes got big around, and I tried to shush her. It didn't work. It just so happens that I know this artist, and I know for a fact that he did not copy it from some magazine. The odds that there is a magazine out there with this picture in it are, you have a better chance of winning the lottery twice than you would finding a magazine with this between its folds. The lady came around to face Katie, and as I've said before, Katie is 40-ish, but looks 20-ish. I dare say, young lady, that you aren't even old enough to understand art, let alone tell me what I've seen and what I've not seen. And I dare say, young lady, that I'm probably older than you are, and I've seen more art in the last 20 years than you've seen in your entire lifetime. I've met more artists, more famous artists, and more up-and-coming artists than you'll ever know. When I say this is an original work, this is an original work. Katie was starting to get fired up, and I didn't want the gallery owner to have to ask her to leave, which has happened once before. My lady does like to defend her man. Just as the lady was about to retort to something, another artist came up and said, Lady, there is no way you've seen this as some photograph in any magazine. There are elements here that just simply don't belong, and that is exactly why this cannot be a copy. Those trees don't belong. Those bushes don't belong, and even the river itself doesn't belong. There is no river like that anywhere in the desert. All the rivers around us are slow and lazy, and this is fast and rushing. I think this artist must have been high when he painted this. He gave me a very obscure nudge in the ribs when he said that last part because we've admired each other's work, 
and I have one of his paintings in my house, and he has one of my paintings in his house. The difference between us is that his paintings start at six figures and hang all over the world, and mine, mine just don't. You don't know what you're talking about, the lady said. You're just some hippie living in some commune who hopes to make a few bucks on the pity of somebody else's hard work. I couldn't help it. I laughed. I turned and looked at this woman and said, He, pointing to the guy that jumped to my rescue, has paintings in the White House. He has paintings in every major art museum in the US and parts of the world. He has a waiting list of a decade for his paintings. His house alone is probably worth more than what you will ever make in your lifetime. Although, to give her due credit, he did look like he probably lived in some commune high in the peaks. Writing this, I won't tell you his name because I haven't asked him if I can include it in the story. While I'm sure he wouldn't mind, he likes stuff like this. I'd rather wait an update at a later day. So this lady is about to say something when gallery owner comes over and puts a hand on my friend's shoulder and she asks, Distinguished artist, how are we doing tonight? I am so glad that you decided to come up the mountain and visit us. The lady's mouth opened like the gape of a tunnel at the name dropping. I was just explaining to this lady how OP here could never have painted this from a photograph as one just does not exist. She couldn't have seen this in a magazine as the elements just don't exist in nature the way he's painted them. Laughing gallery owner asked, Do you remember OP about a couple of years ago? You had that one painting that had a coyote in the brush and the limbs made it look like it had antlers? Oh, I remember that. Katie said excitedly. OP wanted to fix that and I wouldn't let him. Do you remember the man who swore that he's got coyotes with antlers running around his chicken farm? Gallery owner asked. Distinguished artist looked at me and asked, Were you on drugs? He teases me about this even though he knows I'm seriously against that sort of thing. I mean, I don't even drink. You? You didn't paint this, the lady said lightly. He sure did, Katie jumped in, still excited. I watched him from his blocking colors to his signature. I love to watch him paint. I watched as the lady slinked off, and when she was gone, I asked gallery owner, Who was that? Shaking her head from side to side, she said, She's crazy Karen, who thinks she knows all there is to know about art and paintings, and she just trashes this artist, and then that one just to get her kicks in. I don't know why I let her into these things. She never buys anything. Well, I know this story didn't have that explosive ending that you all clamor for, but it's one of the few Karen or near Karen stories I have. I sold all of my paintings and the city bought one of distinguished artist's paintings because, well, he is just superior at what he does and they were discounted for the showing. When we got home, Katie just had to tell our daughter the whole story and daughter said, isn't he always doing something like that, putting in stuff that doesn't belong? Katie gave me a look from the side of her face and said, that's how you can tell it never came from a photograph. Do any of you guys like to paint? Or how about draw? Please let me know. I was a master finger painter back in my day. You can't leave until you shovel all of the snow. This wasn't me doing the malicious compliance nor the request, but the middleman who witnessed this gloriousness. I worked for a movie theater company in a state that snows every winter. We had a contract with a snow shoveling company but my boss refused to use it because the costs of each removal had a possibility of hurting his yearly bonus by a couple percent points, like $300 max out of $20,000. Only if it snows more than six inches, he would say every time. Unfortunately, this meant that one of the ushers would have to shovel snow on the sidewalk. Since it's a safety hazard to block the emergency exit doors of a theater, it meant you had to shovel a path around the entire building and for each exit door. Ultimately, due to the size, it's about a quarter mile around the building. No one likes doing it because it's cold, and shoveling a simple one shovel length path can take two hours. During a snowy Christmas week, the busiest week for movie theaters of the year, imagine Black Friday shopping for two weeks straight. It had snowed just under six inches. We were extremely busy, and my boss demanded to take one of our much needed ushers to go shovel snow. I was an assistant manager. When we asked if the company could come out instead of us doing it, we were told no, to which one of my coworkers, we'll call him Dan, said he would do it. An hour later, after he had gone outside, one by one, my boss pulled each usher in and wrote them up for refusing to shovel snow. When Dan came back in, the other ushers complained to him about it. Dan asked our boss why, 
and our boss said that it was because no one wanted to shovel all of the snow, and if Dan didn't shovel all of the snow, he would get written up as well. This all happened at the beginning of my shift, around 5 p.m. Cue the malicious compliance. What my boss didn't realize was that it was the last day of the payroll period. Being Christmas week, Dan had already accumulated 40 hours of work earlier in the day. My boss left right after telling Dan to make sure all of the snow was removed. We worked the rest of the shift and everyone assumed Dan had finished and left. It's 3 a.m. now and we go to punch out for the week, but can't because there is a shift that hasn't been approved yet. Someone is still working and is at 12 hours of overtime. It's Dan. I go out to investigate since it should only be myself and my manager. As I walk outside, I see Dan coming back in, smiling the biggest grin on his face and the most dry, unsnowed path I've ever seen in my life. It looked like two pictures cut together. There was not a speck of snow on the entire front path of the theater. Dan spent 10 hours outside making sure that he removed all the snow from the walkway. We had a good laugh, clocked off, and left. We didn't hear anything until later that week when I was called into the office and had to write out a statement to why I let Dan work 12 hours of overtime. He had this smug look on his face like he had beaten us. He was not too pleased when he found out that all of our statements included him saying the phrase, remove all of the snow, and that he refused to call the snowplow company. My boss was transferred to another theater soon after. Do you guys like snow or do you hate it? Please let me know. Oh, I love the snow. It's so cold. Just like my heart. Get off your dang chair and help. I'm currently working for a third-party vendor for one of the most well-known retail stores in the US. Hint, Blue Vest Era. My priority is selling mobile data plans and mobile accessories. In other words, I'm the phone person. This also means that while I work at the electronics counter in the store of Blue Vests, I don't actually work for them. This of course also means that there are certain tasks I'm not supposed to do, including ringing up people that aren't purchasing any mobile accessories. There are sometimes exceptions, like when the rest of the electronics associates are swamped because of understaffing. While I try to help out when they're super busy, the point is that I'm not supposed to too often. One afternoon when I was adding some inventory to the system, one of the associates asked if I could ring up this lady, who is now Karen, who was buying iPhone screen protectors. He was the only associate working at the time and there was a mini line of five people. He wanted to help the next customer while I ring up Karen. One thing I forgot to mention is that I have my own little area at the electronics counter. There I have my own little seat and computer that many customers have mistaken as a cash register. It's understandable since there is also a card reader there. Not much happened while I was checking her items out. It was just any normal transaction at the cash register. She thanks me and I tell her to have a good day. Afterward, I go back to my seat to complete the inventory. About 10 minutes later, while I'm still sitting at my computer, it happens. Karen taps her nails on my counter. Me, looking at her, smiling. Yes? Karen shoves her pointer finger into my face. You, you need to get off your dang chair and help everyone that's in line right now. Me, immediately annoyed. Excuse me? We have all been waiting in line and you've just been sitting here doing nothing. It's not other associate. Ma'am, she actually isn't a Walmart associate and is actually supposed to strictly be in charge of phones. Karen, surprised he came to my defense. Oh, I was just trying to help you, other associate. Yes, I understand. But if you could just wait in line, I will be able to assist you soon. Karen, oh, okay, okay. You see, I just thought I saw her, other associate. Yes, I understand. Then the Karen left without apologizing, of course just kind of waddled off. The other associate and I just shared a look like, what the heck was that? Karen didn't even go back in line. In fact, she wasn't in line in the first place. I had already helped her and she left and for some reason felt the need to come back and yell at me. But yeah, so that's my little I don't work here story. I have a couple more, but this is the first one that came to mind. Hope you enjoyed. Oh, and I treated that associate to Starbucks. Speaking of the store with the blue vests, when was the last time you went to Walmart? I need to go soon myself. I love Walmart. They have the best managers to harass. Customer insults me and my coworkers during an IT support call. I work at a company that primarily supports hotel Wi-Fi, 
and taking calls from guests needing help connecting is part of that. Part of my job at the time of this happening was being an escalation point for unresolved guest problems. One time, roughly two years ago, there was some huge hurricane going through Florida. So a lot of our hotels in Alabama and Northern Florida were packed with people evacuating their homes. Most people staying at these hotels were bringing most of their possessions as well. Anyways, I got a message from the guest support team asking me to take a call from one of these guests from Florida so I could help them connect the dozen or so devices they had to the Wi-Fi. For some reason, they were refusing to connect and tier one support couldn't resolve it. I start talking to the guy and he is immediately hostile towards me and gave the whole, I know what I'm doing, I'm tech savvy. I shrugged it off and after about 30 minutes, I was able to get every single one of his devices connected. After that, he was still incredibly upset and started ranting about how incompetent the employees he had been previously talking to were and being upset at me that I took so long to get his stuff connected too. I forget most of the crap he was spewing at me, but I'll never forget him saying, your texts are worthless. At this point, I should have just hung up on him, but I froze up a little and let him continue. He ended up insisting that I help him set up his Plex server, which is against the hotel's terms of service since he could potentially be using it to stream movies. I finally got my manager involved and we called the GM of the hotel and brought her up to speed while the guest was on hold. I got her conferenced into the call and immediately she began chewing him out and telling him he cannot talk to their support staff this way and that we had other more considerate guests to be assisting. He tried defending himself, telling her how long we took, but she was not having it and told him he had two hours to get all of his belongings and leave or she would call the police. I'm not sure why she let me stay on the call for this long, but this guy begged her to let him stay since he had just finished lugging everything he owned into his room and every other hotel around was booked. She didn't budge, however, and after scolding the guy some more, she told me I could disconnect. Never in my life had I seen justice delivered so swiftly. This is the story I always tell people when talking about crazy support calls. Please remember this the next time you consider blowing up at tech support staff. Now some of you have been suggesting that we create a podcast. So we did. You can now listen to the Mr. Reddit podcast on Spotify. I spoke to the manager and he said it was okay. Well, let's call and find out. Backstory. A buddy of mine's family runs a small convenience store slash bait and tackle shop in the US and I help out every now and then since I work at a gas station. Like 98% of stores, the shop is currently operating on a one toilet paper slash paper towel item per family policy. My friend's dad, the owner, told me in person that no one is allowed to buy more than one per family. No ifs, ands, or buts. Cue the scene. We've got me. We've got entitled dad. We've got embarrassed kid and the store owner. I'm waiting out the last half hour of when I said I'd help run the store on my own when Entitled Dad and Entitled Kid walk in, decked out in fishing gear. Entitled Dad grabs a packet of worms, some sodas, ice, and snacks. As he passes by the toiletry section, he grabs four packages of toilet paper. Me. I'm sorry, sir, but store policy is currently only one per family. I call that out across the store, but Entitled Dad ignores me. He and Entitled Kid select a few more things and walk up to the counter. Entitled Kid is trying hard to not be seen, so I can tell he knows what's coming. Me. Sir, unfortunately, I'm only able to sell you one toilet paper package right now. Entitled Dad, already getting angry. Well, why not? Me. Due to what's going on, our store is only allowing one toilet paper item per family. Well, there's no sign back there. Me. Yes, there is, sir. There's a sign every six feet around the store and at the register listing what items are being limited. Entitled Dad. Well, I know the owner, and he says it's okay for me to buy as many as I want from here. Entitled Kid has now retreated to the door, clearly wanting to leave and not be here. Me. You spoke to the owner? Entitled Dad, getting irritated now. Yes, I did. Now are you going to ring me up or what? Me. The owner specifically said that you could buy however much you wanted? Yes. Can you please hurry it up? I want to be on the lake soon. Me. Sir, I know the manager didn't say anything to you because I'd have known about it. Entitled Dad. Are you calling me a liar? I'm reporting you to the owner the next time I talk to him. Me. Pulls out phone. How about now? 
entitled Dad. What? Me, calling the owner and putting phone on speaker. Let's call him right now. If he says it's okay, I'll ring you up and apologize. Before Entitled Dad can say anything, store owner picks up. Owner, hey OP, what's up? Me, nothing much. I have Entitled Dad here, and he says you told him he could ignore store policy on toilet paper. Owner, Entitled Dad, can I have your name so I know who I told? Entitled Dad's face breaks out in hope, thinking he's bluffed his way through this and gives his name. Owner, Entitled Dad, I don't know who the heck you are or what the heck you're talking about. I haven't told anyone that they could ignore store policy. By purchasing more than one, you are possibly depriving others that may desperately need that toilet paper. And if you're really needing that much of it, I would seriously suggest you consult a doctor, not just buy more of it. If you can't follow store policy like every other customer that's come in, then you can leave. Owner hangs up. Entitled Dad has his mouth open in shock while Entitled Kid is looking like all major holidays and his birthday are happening today. Entitled Dad shuts his mouth, stands in front of the register for a few seconds, shouts a final, forget you, and storms out of the store, leaving all of his items at the counter. Did any of you guys run out of toilet paper recently? Or did you have enough? Please let me know. I never ran out. I know how to get the managers to bend the rules. My friend is a VIP guest of honor, and I don't think we're getting adequate service. Why you should never accept a pre-tip. What is a pre-tip? It's gratuity received before service is rendered. I was warned by an astute veteran in my early years, never accept the pre-tip, because now you transfer the role of your service from one of anticipation to expectation. But of course, I wouldn't be here to share a most delightful story had I heeded the code. It's a busy late evening working shift, an hour from close, and I've got the whole back half of the restaurant to myself. This includes the big, fancy family table, the centerpiece of the back room. Normally, we'd phase down, close off the room, and seat all the stragglers in the front room to consolidate all service and closing duties. Not tonight. The hosts giddily receive me. We've got one last table for you in the back, but trust us, it's so worth it. This woman has been talking to us about her friend non-stop. She's some really special person who won some international award. I don't really know, but she gave us each $20 and says she wants the best server and the best table, and we thought of you right away. Yeah, I'm game. If it's good people, good vibes, good generosity, let's do it. I'm very proactive, so I asked the hosts to point her out so I could introduce myself and get a better handle on all of the fanfare. She was full of pep. You're our server? Great. So my friend is visiting from out of town. It's her first time here, and I want to make sure it's a really special evening. She's really amazing. She's won all sorts of international awards. She's an Obama scholar. She's from Peru. She's very VIP and very near and dear to me. Take care of us, and I'll take care of you. We are great tippers. Wow. Even I can't wait to meet her. Sweet. Well, you're in good hands. There was a little something off. I double checked with the hosts in the back. Yeah, she's a little intense, but she seems very nice and sweet. Okay. The rest of the party finally showed up and we took them back. Someone had brought little party hats for the whole group and the mood was festive and upbeat. Everyone seemed normal, relaxed and easygoing, so I breathed a sigh of relief. I began taking drink orders, and when I got back to Karen, she gives me the most unsurreptitious of winks with a curdled, come hither, red rum finger waggle. She reaches out with her other fist and unfurls a wet, crumpled $20 bill in my hand. Very discreet and subtle, miss. She begins pointing across her body at her friend and states, This is my friend. She's visiting from out of town. She's an Obama scholar, and she's VIP. Far out, dude. I head back to put in their drinks, and she follows me back to the computer. You got that $20 bill, right? Oh, no. So I'm thinking, can you present her with like a special drink? Do you guys do singing or dancing or anything fancy like that? Double oh no. Yeah, sure, I've got some ideas. Don't worry about it. Go have a seat and enjoy yourself. You're in good hands. I spent the $20. Gotta spend money to make money, know what I mean? $15 on our fanciest cocktails with all the bells, whistles, and accoutrements, and paid the busser with broken Spanglish $5 to come out and present the drink. 
I got a few other co-workers to join us in the room, banged on the ceremonial gong, passed out our own party hats and bibs, and made a big loud scene as my buddy introduced her to the room. Cool, out of sight, out of mind. Time to focus on the rest of my stuff. Sure enough, she was waiting at the computer for me. Hey, what was the deal with all the Spanish? And also, my friend doesn't drink alcohol. A lot to unpack here. I thought you said she's from Peru. She's Peruvian, but she's not from Peru. She doesn't speak Spanish. So why mention it at all? Internal rage. Sorry then, I must have misunderstood. In terms of the drink, it's already poured and delivered, so anyone else at the table is welcome to share it. Okay, well I'm just wondering what other special surprises you have for the table. Oh no. Honestly, I could maybe do a dessert at the end of the meal, but we've done the drink, the introduction, the clapping, the gong, the hats, the bibs. If you think of something else, just let me know and I'll see what I can do. We've officially reached dance monkey dance levels of torture. Deep sigh. I take care of some other stuff and head back into the room to take their food order. That's right, dear reader, we haven't even breached the meat of the sandwich. She's against the wall and adjusting light dimmers for the room. I come over. Hey, I can take care of that for you. There are fickle lights on antiquated circuits and she somehow set the playlist to strobe. It's too dark in here, and can you lower the music volume? I'm plunging down Dante's Inferno. Just get through this. I get their food order and put it in. Perfect. Time to work the rest of my tables in the front room. I'm in the back kitchen, talking such mad crap, and everyone is giving me pity, but also making fun of me. Shouldn't have taken the money. I know. I overhear a voice. She's standing at the computer, and now she's asking other staff where I am. I pop out. Hey, I don't understand. I thought we were going to be entertained. My friend is visiting from out of town. She's a VIP. She's an Obama scholar. I explain my situation with the other tables and that my attention can't be bogarted. Asked her to please have a seat. The food's almost out. My GM is right there, enjoying her post-shift glass of wine at the end of the bar. Witness to all of this, an incredulous look on her face. Not gonna get her involved. Enjoy your wine, dear. You've earned it. The night persists. I'm shaking from trauma. There's no way I'm going to visit that room for any reason other than basic service. Now she's at the host stand. She's peppering the poor hosts with the same tirade. I hear Obama scholar again, so I come over and ask her to leave them alone. She's aghast. I cut her off, pull a $20 bill out of my book, and hand it to her. Please take this. You are making my job stressful and harassing my staff, and I just can't do it anymore. We've done everything we can for your friend, but this is not okay. Please take this and have a normal meal. She doesn't take the bill, but takes the hint and walks back to her table. Success! She's looking mighty surly now, but when I come by the table, not a peep. Make it to dessert, make it to the bill, thank God. Final hurdle. Why did you charge us gratuity? I already gave you guys tips. My patience is spent. No, that was cash you gave us to do you favors, and we did those favors. This is for service. And that was that. And no, never heard a complaint or follow up. And for the most part, it seemed the rest of the table was completely oblivious to all her shenanigans. Never, ever, ever accept the pre-tip. What would you have done if you were in the situation? Would you have given the 20 back to her or just tried to make her happy? Please let me know. She did nothing wrong. Didn't you hear her friend was a VIP? An Obama scholar? Bride refuses to let me leave a tiny horse stall. I know this title is confusing as it is, so allow me to explain this a bit. I was asked by my stepsister to DJ at her wedding, which was located in a barn. The day prior to the wedding, we had spent the entire day decorating the heck out of this barn to her specifications, and I had spent the better part of three hours of that day trying to troubleshoot the problems with the speaker set and why the provided phone and playlist wasn't working with the adapter. After finally getting the phone to be compatible, I began testing audio and seeing just how loud the volume had to be to reach the entire barn. The speaker could reach up to volumes of 100, with 25 being loud but bearable to hear. But I had to pump this speaker up to 87 to be heard across the entire barn. Before leaving for that day, I asked the bride to email me the playlist or to give her phone to someone who will arrive at the barn before her so I can hook up the music. 
the day of the wedding. I arrived 30 minutes early, as discussed, and she didn't leave her phone with anyone or email me the music. I approach her aunt, who was in charge of keeping things together and asked what to do. She told me to just sit in the stall and wait for the bride to arrive with the playlist. I should mention now that I was wearing a gothic style dress and it was a really humid day. Per the bride's request, she wanted me to wear dark colors so as not to draw any attention to me or the booth. I didn't contest this, so I began configuring the speakers to be ready to play the music once she arrived and handed me the phone. As soon as she entered the barn, she lit into me. Why isn't the music playing? Me. I never got the music as a CD or as an email playlist to bring on my own phone. Whatever. She hands me her phone. Just get the music playing and start the Here Comes the Bride music at exactly 4.30. Me. Not a problem. I get the music hooked up and play in the regular playlist for the guests and step out of the stall to get some fresh air. That stall was getting really stuffy and the reverb in that stall was making my head pound just the first two minutes in. As soon as she saw me step out, she made a gesture to her aunt and her aunt pointed at me. Aunt, get back in the booth. Me, huh? The music is set to loop. I don't need to be in there until 4.30. It's only 4.17. Aunt, bride wants you to stay in the booth. Stay in the booth. Me, okay? I didn't want to start a fight, but I was already feeling like I was being wronged by being forced to stay in a small horse stall with the reverb making my head rattle. Not wanting to confront them, I conceded and went back into the booth. If you can imagine being stuck beside a loudspeaker in a movie theater for an extended period of time, that is how bad it was for just two minutes. Now imagine that for roughly another 15 minutes as I'm waiting for the cue to start the Here Comes the Bride song she renamed on her phone. At 4.30 I start the song and she starts walking down the aisle. Once I start turning it down for them to start the ceremony, I step out of the stall to watch the ceremony, only to be shoved back into the booth by the aunt and told, quite sternly, not to leave the stall. So I sit there, unable to time when to play the walking away song until the aunt starts flailing her limbs, which I took as a signal. Once the newlyweds have left the aisle, I shifted the playlist back to the waiting list and moved to step out, only to be shoved back in again, this time by the bride. Bride, are you trying to ruin my wedding? Me. No, I just can't be expected to stay in this booth the entire time. It's my wedding. If I tell you to stay in there, you are staying in there. Me. Look, I don't want to be rude on your special day, but please remember that I'm doing this for free and as a huge inconvenience to me. I have a term paper due by 2 a.m. At any time, I could leave and have someone else deal with the technical mess that is this DJ booth that smells like horse crap. The bride stormed off crying and tried to tell her father, my stepdad, that I was ruining her wedding. He mostly took it with a grain of salt and just continued to mingle with the rest of the guests. About two hours passed by and my mom entered the booth. Mom, aren't you going to come out and eat? Me, I'm not allowed to leave. Bride said so. Mom, what? She flagged down my stepdad. You haven't eaten anything, have you? Me, haven't even been able to use the bathroom. At this point, not only do I have to use the bathroom badly, but I was feeling extremely disoriented from the reverb from the booth for two hours and the heat, as well as not having eaten anything. Stepdad, you don't look so good. Mom, we're going home. Stepdad, doesn't Pride need OP to run the booth until everyone gets home? Me, I set the music to the dance playlist and unsteadily stand up. It's set to loop. If someone wants to fiddle with this, it's their problem. I feel like I'm going to barf. As we're leaving, the bride starts to berate me for leaving the booth again when my mom and stepdad looked at her for a moment and simply said, we are going home. On the half hour car ride back to the house, I had passed out and woke up to my mom gently patting my face to wake me up and her holding some DQ under my nose. After corralling me into the house, we had to check my blood sugar levels. I had dipped into a low blood sugar level and for the next two days, I was barely able to hear anything with how much my ears were ringing. The bride was also whining those two days about how unprofessional it was for me to leave the booth looking the way I did. On a plus note, I did submit the term paper on time. Edit. So, a common question is the sister-in-law and stepsister thing. I kind of have a mixed verbiage due to where I was raised, but she is my stepsister. Hope that clears it up better. Edit 2. 
It appears that some people don't understand full background on this situation. That is my fault. I live with my mom and stepdad. It was not my speaker setup they provided to me. They kept handing me the wrong cables from God knows where in that nightmare of a barn, half of which were shorted out or badly frayed, which I refused to use for safety reasons. I'm not a professional DJ at all. I only told them, get me a loudspeaker, a laptop, and the music playlist, either on a CD or a phone, and I'll be able to get this working. I jerry-rigged that setup. That's why it took so long to hook up. Me not standing up for myself was my mistake back then, but I haven't let that happen again, especially with that entitled jerk of a sibling. Even my stepdad is still disgusted with her behavior that day. What would you have done? Would you have just stayed in the booth? Or would you have gotten out of there too? Please let me know. She's lucky it wasn't my wedding. I would have taught her a lesson. Entitled old woman wants me to give her my seat. I'm on crutches. Two weeks ago, I fell down the stairs in my house and broke my ankle and a couple bones in my foot. My foot rolled off one stair and landed on the next at a 90 degree angle and then managed to get caught in the banister a couple tumbles later. All this to say it was very broken. I've been on crutches and my foot slash ankle in a huge neon green cast since then. I was on the train coming back from a doctor's appointment, unrelated to the foot. My mom dropped me off on her way to work, but obviously wasn't able to drive me back home. The bus I take after the train stops half a block from my house, so I'm able to make it home pretty easily. It was about 4.30 p.m. on a Tuesday, so the train has no empty seats. A kind stranger had given me the seat closest to the train doors. These seats are typically reserved for the disabled, pregnant, or elderly, and I think me and my leg fit into that category. They have a little sticker above them that show a pregnant woman, an elderly person, and someone missing a leg. This will be relevant later. The train stopped at the busiest stop on our line, the dreaded mall stop. It's one stop before my station. A couple people clear out, a bunch more push on. Enter entitled old lady. She's 78. She yells it a little while later. No obvious mobility issues. For context, the doors open on the left side of the train. I was sitting on the right side. She power walks over to me, ignoring the priority seating on the left side and says, I need that seat. I'm an elderly citizen. I say, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm actually on crutches and can't properly stand on the train. My crutches are stood there right next to me so there's no way she didn't see them. Old lady, it doesn't matter. These seats are for the elderly, disabled, and pregnant. You're injured, not disabled, so you need to give the seat to me. At this point, the train starts up, does its little jolt, which she manages just fine. The kind stranger from earlier, who has a new seat about five seats down from me. Ma'am, she needs that seat. Can't you see the crutches and cast? You can have my seat. Old lady, no, it's fine. This girl is a kid and doesn't need this seat. She can take yours. Me. The train is moving, so I won't be able to safely get over there. Plus, it's too far from the doors, so I won't be able to get up and get out when my station comes. I don't want to miss my stop. Old lady. I'm 78. You're a kid. The sign clearly doesn't show kids on crutches. It shows old women. I need that seat. At this point, people all around are listening in and offering their seats. The person two seats down gets up and walks away. Old lady keeps yelling that I don't respect my elders and need to move. She moves to grab at my crutches but is pulled back by kind stranger who is now standing between me and old lady. Old lady is now yelling at kind stranger for grabbing her. The person from two seats down has come back with a transit officer who is checking tickets on the opposite side of the train car. Oh officer, thank god. This kid refuses to give up her seat for me. And this man just grabbed me and pushed me across the train. Officer. Ma'am, this young lady clearly needs the seat more than you, because you've been standing and yelling for two minutes now. I saw you go to grab at her crutches, and kind stranger was simply protecting the young woman. I'm going to have to ask you to leave at the next stop if you continue harassing them. Old lady dejectedly walks down to the opposite side of the train and death glares everyone else. After another minute, the train stops at my station. I asked the officer if I could leave and he helped me off the train. I thanked the officer, kind stranger, and the woman who went to get the officer. Anticlimactic ending, but no oh well. I very obviously had the crutches and was wearing a knee length dress so the neon green cast was very visible. I hope her leg got better. Speaking of broken bones, 
Have any of you guys ever broken a bone? And if so, which bone was it? Please let me know. If I had been that old lady, I would have broken another bone. Seven dollars for a sandwich? I want to see a manager. It finally happened. I witnessed my first Karen. Boyfriend and I went to the local mini market to get some pizza dough. Thankfully, there's not much of a line, so we get on and wait our turn. Suddenly, we see slash hear this lady, henceforth known as Karen. Unfortunately, she doesn't have the haircut. Go off on this poor cashier girl complaining about the sandwich from the deli. I'm guessing she didn't know the price until it was rung up, because suddenly we hear, Seven dollars? Are you kidding? My boyfriend and I look at each other like, Oh God, Karen, I want to see a manager. This is ridiculous. The cashier goes and comes back with a manager within two seconds. It's a small store. I gotta give credit, this guy doesn't back down. Karen is complaining about the price of the sandwich and manager is explaining that the weight of the meat in the sandwich equals the price. She is not having it. Karen, I can get it for much cheaper at the deli down the street. In my head, I'm like, then why are you here? Karen, I'm still gonna buy it, but just look at it. This isn't much meat. Manager, I'm sorry you don't like our prices, but that's how much it is with the weight of the meat, cheese, and spread. Karen, but that's far too high. Let me show you the sandwich. Manager, miss, if you open the container, you have to buy it. I'll still pay for it, but I'm never coming here again. Lady proceeds to open the container and show him the contents of the sandwich. Manager, there's plenty of meat and cheese. Karen, but not worth $7. Manager, I don't make the prices. I'm sorry, miss. Manager rolls his eyes and leaves. This lady is now berating this cashier who has nothing to do with the pricing. My first job when I was 17 was as a cashier for a supermarket, so I immediately empathized with the girl. There's so much you want to say, but can't, because you have to keep that customer service smile in order to get that paycheck. The other cashier calls for me and boyfriend to ring us up. Then I hear this ridiculousness. Karen, what's happened to the people who used to own this place? They never would have priced it like this. Cashier, I'm not sure. I was hired after new ownership took over. Even so, they no longer own this store. Karen, I'm going to make a complaint. This is ridiculous. Seven dollars for a tiny sandwich? Okay, so I've been to this store many, many times. The sandwiches aren't big, but there's a decent amount of meat in there, and it depends on what kind of sandwich you get. At this point, I've had enough, and so has boyfriend. We don't want to make a scene, and I'm not very good with confrontation. Boyfriend and I leave. The exit is right where Karen and the cashier are. We get to exit, and just before we leave, I shout, Bye, Karen! Karen turns her head to look at me with bewildered eyes. I walk off. Boyfriend looks at this lady with an annoyed slash disapproving look. It may have been a bit cowardly, but I'm still kind of proud of it. Especially when I heard one of the cashiers let out a laugh. Boyfriend and I laugh all the way back to the car. I don't know what happened after we left, but from the look at that lady's face, I think she realized just how she looked. Not very dramatic, no cops, no rants, just an entitled lady complaining about a sandwich. Oh, and boyfriend and I made an awesome pizza. Speaking of sandwiches, where's your favorite place to get sandwiches from? I used to go to this place called Schlotzky's back in the day. They were really good. I prefer Panera Bread. My Jason's Deli is a close second. That time we had to call the cops. So, at the time I was working in a place that sells undergarments for both men and women. Men's was actually our best-selling department. The most important fact to know in this story is that boxers cost more than boxer briefs. Moving right along, you know how customers just love to pick things up and abandon them in the wrong place? Well, this time that ended up with a butterfly effect in which we needed to call the police and get security escorts to our cars at the end of the night due to an absolutely psychotic man not getting his way. We had both a wall lined with products for men as well as a couple bins in the men's section for excess stock for customers to take what they needed. One of these bins contained briefs. I'm sure you all know where this is going. A large red-headed man, like at least 6 feet tall and 250 pounds, muscular, walks up to co-workers register with a pack of boxers and a pack of socks to get our buy one get one 50% off promotion. This is Crazy Man. Coworker, who's a little old lady by the way, rings up his items and tells him his total. I'm on the register next to her 
and it was a busy weekend day, so I can hear all of this. Not that I'll need to be that close. Crazy Man starts flipping out. Crazy Man. Why is it so expensive? I didn't pick anything up that expensive. Coworker. Well, the socks cost this much, and the boxers cost this much. So, with the sale, that's what the total comes to. No. The boxers cost less than that. I read the sign. They definitely cost less. Would you mind showing me where you picked these up, sir? Crazy Man brings her over to the bin. Coworker. I'm sorry, sir. It looks like another customer put these in the wrong spot, pointing to where the boxes are on the wall. They're actually this much. My manager was in the men's section and stopped what she was doing to listen in. Crazy Man. Well, you had them in the wrong place, so you have to honor that price. Sir, I don't have control of where other customers leave things. There are no other boxers in this bin. They cost this much. If it was an error on our part, I would honor it, but it isn't. You need to honor the price. No, sir. I can remove the item if you aren't interested. Are you stupid? You need to do what I said. <gasps> Manager intervenes. Manager. Excuse me, sir. What seems to be the problem? I found boxers here in this bin, and your employee won't honor the price. I'm sorry, sir, but it looks like a customer put them there. We cannot give you the boxers for the price of the briefs. I have never been in a store that treats customers like this. You need to give me them at that price because that's where I found them. <gasps> Sir, I do not have the authority to change the prices. At this point, literally the entire store has stopped and is staring at a distance at this enraged linebacker of a man screaming. Yes, you do. You can change the price. Do it now. I can't do that, sir. How to punch you in your smart mouth. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. No! You're going to give me my boxers. He has his finger in her face. At the lower price, not your ripoff price. At this point, I left to call security, and apparently a couple of people had called police after the man threatened my manager. He's still screaming, but I can't tell what he's saying. The police department is only a few minutes down the street from the store, so by the time I was finished with security, the police were in the store and escorting the man who was still raging out. Security arrives maybe five minutes later and ended up escorting me and my manager to our cars after closing later as people reported that he was threatening us all. In case you were wondering, this was all over $2.50. So Karen, what did you think of today's stories? They were horrible. Horrible? How dare you? These were some of the best we've ever read. Oh, shut up, Mr. Reddit. It's ridiculous what people like myself have to go through. Dealing with stupid people like yourself and your subscribers. Look, Karen, you can say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my re-army. Tch, <laughs> re-army. Most of your viewers aren't even subscribed to your channel. 70% if I'm correct. Well, I can't argue with that. That's true, most... Most of my viewers don't actually subscribe for some reason. It's because you're stupid, Mr. Reddit. No, I'm not. All right, guys, let's prove Karen wrong by making sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on notifications. Pah, they're not going to listen to you. And if you'd like me or Karen, what? To record a special message for you, come visit me on Fiverr. Link pinned in the comments below. Never. And join as a channel member today and Karen will give you a special shout out in the next video. Like heck I will!